um, we, we thought, you know what, there's nothing better than in mathematics than start off with like some math, right? So we uh, thought about that yesterday. I said, okay. Uh, Ripa had brought uh, this, uh, one of her students, um, well, one of her students, yeah, one of her students came up with something like that. And we said, it'll be a nice introduction to start off with. We're not gonna, well, we can ask you what you think about something like that yet, now. But believe me, we're not going to discuss more because we will bring it up later on in more detail. The, the, uh, so hold on to your thoughts and to your comments. No, no, we're uh, like, we, I want to hear a bit like what they think about it now. And then we come back on the, the... And, and, and the comments. Yes, yes. So, okay. Everyone, what do you think about this? What was the question? Ah. Rita, what's the question? The question is to solve the problem, you know, to find the, uh, the X and Y, the values. Well, my, my idea is why don't you do the comparison method with uh, X equals X and then you find Y right, right away. Like, I don't know why we have to go all the way to finding, like putting X on both sides. We already have x equals and x equals we could do the comparison method which is 2y plus 4 equals negative 3y minus y yes but why do you think the student like did this because they don't understand what they're doing but they have to compare a y with y before so they did that which is uh, still work <laughs> it still works but it's not the best the most efficient it might be because the teacher showed it where you always have y equals and so they went to something that they've seen before. Yeah. Could be. Could be. So if you get the student in your class, what's the first thing you would do? You say, okay, what is this? What does that tell you about your students? That's what I'm trying to get. Which would you mention all of you? Yes. They know their algebra. I mean, they, they don't understand anything, but they can do it. <laughs> <laughs> right huh? it's it's good nice. yes so okay so we keep uh, going thank you uh, Micheline. keep these thoughts together because these we're going to come back and revisit these thoughts for sure so i'm going to start off by saying thank you everybody for 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 coming for today's fnm um we it's a really, really important subject and we hold dear to our hearts, me and Rita, the Mathematic Intervention Framework. Um, uh, I'm gonna introduce it. So um, my name is Micheline Amar, pedagogical consultant for Le Kipchak, the English sector. Um, and my uh, colleague. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so my name is uh, Rita Nassif and I am uh, a pedagogical uh, consultant for the French uh, sector for uh, le Centre des services uh, scolaires des Milles. Uh, I've been uh, a consultant for almost three years now uh, for math and science. And um, before that, I used to teach uh, in uh, in the uh, age, that, that's how we say it, uh, age uh, school. <laughs> so just to, to let you know, today's agenda is we would like to tackle a few of these um, these question is first of all is why a framework of intervention in mathematics is needed. Uh, the two basic principles of mathematic interventions, what are they? The first principle giving meaning to mathematics and the second principle using problem resolution in diff with different intentions. So um, we will tackle that and hopefully our main goal by the end of this workshop that you will be able to question and clarify the activities intentions that you give to your students uh, reflect on our teaching practices and understand how to better intervene according to mathematics of course uh, with this kind of uh, framework it might make you only um, um, richer as a teacher and all of that with the goal of su the success in learning for our students. So the idea behind this is this framework, this reference book, Le Référentiel de Math, uh, Intervention de Mathématiques, was actually published, if I'm not mistaken, Rita, a few years ago, like three, four years ago um, on the French sector. And I think it was mainly published in the high school. 
right, if I'm not mistaken, and and we took it over uh, in uh, the, of course, the adult general education in the age, and we felt this is a really nice resource to kind of support our teaching, our mathematical teaching. And what's so interesting about this book is, of course, when we're teaching math, and we know it's Unfortunately, wanting it or not, math seems to be the, the one of the highest discipline that was found problematic in the province of Quebec. Students have difficulties in math and we try our best and we always need other inspiration to do our job better. So a uh, bunch of researchers, they looked at research, um, they looked at the best practices and they put this document together. And it's really, really actually very interesting. And yesterday we were having a conversation with Gita and she says, I read it a couple of times a year, just to, as a refresher because it's very, very well written and it's very uh, helpful. Uh, she found that it really, really helped her. And when I read it a couple of times myself and I thought, you know, how come we don't have it in English? So hopefully I know I had voiced it a couple of times and I have brought it up to other people's intention and it will be, I hope will be translated super. The ministry promised that it will be translated soon. So hopefully we'll get it soon. But the whole idea behind it, it's really, it's a document that was, that brought up lots of idea questions like questioning us as teacher on how we teach our math and where should we look and how we could support our students to better our practices. So I thought it was a, as a very, very nice document to bring to our sector. And I'm happy that Rita is here uh, to kind of uh, give other insight on the defense yeah. side. I'm happy to be here with you too. Um, I just want to add uh, one thing about like the translation. So since it's like we did it, the translation, Micheline and uh, I, so uh, maybe the, the, when the, if the government does it, like the translation, maybe it won't be the same word that we used, but the, the, the principle and the, 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 the fundamental principle in it, it's are the same, you know? Yeah. So yeah, thank you, Rita, to, to mention that. This is all in-house translation because I felt it that like we waited a while, but I thought it would be like a loss for us not to have. So yeah, it was in-house translation. And please forgive me, forgive us if the term eventually when this is gonna be publicly, you know, published, uh, if some terms don't match, but like we said, we did the best of our ability. I just I wanted to get all of this out to you guys first. <laughs> so um, the two fundamentals, uh, fundamental principles that we will be discussing today is make sense of mathematics based on the understanding of mathematical concepts and processes, uh, processes, uh, and use mathematical so uh, problem solving with different intentions. It's like, and you'll see what we mean by that. But uh, we wanted to bring your attention to the picture. It was picked with, um, with purpose. Uh, just think about uh, if you go mountain climbing, if you were going mountain climbing and you're learning how to uh, mountain climb, one of the first skills you need to know is how to tie a knot. So imagine you learn how to tie a knot a little bit and then suddenly you're, you're, you're um, your trip's starting to be more challenging. You're starting to, like, say, feel com like confident. You want to go higher and higher and steeper and steeper. Can you imagine if you're going higher and higher and steeper and steeper and your skills of making knots is not that good? How far would you get really without getting hurt or without quitting? Right. So we, we use this analogy. It's the same in mathematics. And we see in our classrooms, we have students who know. A little bit how to tie knot, but the higher they're going, the steeper the, the difficulty become, the less and less certain certain skills start showing up, and the less and less they seem to be able to climb that mountain. And, and that's where we thought, oh, this is a super analogy of, of comparing our students with their skill of making knots and their skills of learning mathematics. Right. And I would like to add one more thing, and that's something that, uh, again, we had had a conversation. Having skills, having competency is not enough. It's, it's not, uh, the student himself has to believe, he has to know, he has to believe in his ability that he really does know it so he could actually move forward. It's not just like, a, oh, I'm okay and let's move forward. 
So there's a lot, there's, there's more dimension to learning math. It's a wholesome approach than just learning the basic mathematics. So this is something also to keep in mind because at the end of the day, what matters is what the student believe, right? Um, so I'll let the test start with the first principle. The first principle is giving meaning to mathematics. So uh, basically here, what we want to answer is, uh, what is it to do math, you know? What does it mean to, uh, to do math in a math class? So we're going to think about this, uh, this question, and uh, we're going to try to answer it with the, uh, the, the components that are in the framework. So the first uh, component is uh, the concept conceptual understanding. Um, th this one is actually that the student has to understand the what and the why, the link between the elements of the concept and the link between different com concepts. Um, also, there is the flexibility, which is we let the student find different ways of doing mathematical tasks and compare them. They use their creativity. So they're the one who are trying to solve, uh, find new ways to solve the problem. And they're the one, uh, we let the student find the most efficient way of solving a problem. And that is uh, important uh, for, for the understanding of uh, a concept for the student. So we're gonna see how the three of uh, those components are linked together and how we're gonna like analyze different kind of problem or different kind of thinking of student. So, so uh, we have to, so we can intervene in a different way. And we also have the fluidity, which is the knowledge and the memorization and the automation of facts and procedure. And this one, um, sometimes uh, there are some, some concept that we think that the student know because they're at, at a certain age, but uh, they don't they don't have it that fluidity. So it's it makes it even harder for them to understand uh, a concept because it involves something that they should have uh, automized automized okay. before. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. Yes. So. Yeah. Uh, so actually, this the marriage of these three basic concepts that makes that gives sense to math. And you'll see we're going to break it apart, each one, each component apart, to to investigate it. We try to uh, make the student understand the knowledge. For example, uh, when we talk about the multiplication, we want the student to understand that uh, it means we can compare it to the surface of something. Um, he understand when he has to use it. Uh, he understand, he knows how to recognize the multiplication in different situation. Um, so here, when a student understand this concept of uh, multiplication, um, it's, uh, it becomes um, automatized in uh, his head. So he becomes more fluid. So for him, when, uh, for example, I show him uh, uh, dots, a pack of dots, he's gonna make packages to be able to count them maybe faster. So he's, so it's, so the students, all of that, he understand what, when, how, and why. Uh, he uses his previous knowledge that he knows in life, in uh, his experience to connect the content. Um, he can visually visualize it uh, very easily <laughs> and it solidifies the abstraction. So here, uh, another example that I like to name, uh, you know, in math, uh, the students are allowed to write uh, on a paper uh, uh, memory uh, sheet. They, they're, they're allowed to take it uh, with them okay. in maths. And we've seen some students write definitions of, about some stuff that are really insignificant. For example, uh, you know, uh, in a plan Cartesian, uh, when uh, you see uh, a student writing, uh, you know, the plus plus for this quadrant, uh, plus minus, uh, negative, negative, and there are, you know, in secondary four, and you're like, why do they write that on their memory card? Uh, memory aid. Me memory aid, you know? Um, 
you think it's because you know they should know that because you know they've been doing it for two years now so how come they are they writing something yeah that should be known so it means that there is something here that they don't understand so uh so that's what we're gonna try to figure out yeah and and just to go back here to something that Rita had said, this is where if you have seen a previous uh, um, math, um, one of the mathematical workshop that we've done before, it's also the CRA method, concrete representational abstract. This is where this comes in, right? So again, it's just to make links with basic concepts, with their their what they know and with their environment. So this is a whole uh, orchestra. A symphony that they, uh, they they need to put together. So let's move. So this is an example. So if we read something like this, for example, Raphael reads an average of thirty pages per day. He starts reading at a novel two uh, a novel two days ago. His friend Simon, who reads an average of forty uh, forty pages a day, is now starting the same novel. How many days? Will they have read the same number of pages? So I'll let you read it by yourself. And just think about something. What difficulties do you think your student will face reading a problem like that? Julie? Um, well, it, I guess it depends a little bit of, uh, on what level the students are in. But you can have students who have reading difficulties. I like that some things are bolded. So it does help to bring the attention to what's in bold. I think the question is strange. Like how many days will they have read the same? Like after how many days starting from now, starting from two days ago? Like there's a question for me there. Um, but I'm guessing that's a question for around level two or three when they already know algebra. And they should be like making an algebraic model. So I think for, for this type of question, it's doable to do it only in your head, like just writing numbers of pages according to the day. And you can just continue that like a table until you get that done. Um, so I guess it depends on, on what the student would have to refer to in the, in the course. So well, who, Yes. Uh, he, here, uh, the, the, the student was in uh, secondary tree, but it's a very good uh, uh, point uh, that you, uh, you said, you know, because a student in sec two, he can do it like by, uh, if he's good in arithmetic, well, he can do it also uh, with, uh, but uh, you're right. So, but uh, this is a sec three. So now that you know that, uh, uh, what do you think would be difficult for the student to, uh, solve this kind of problem and i'm sure you've all had had like students who uh, find this really hard you know michelle would you like to try i i think of my students and i think that they could figure it out in their brain like they could do it easily that way kind of like what she said too about the table but i don't know if, like because right now i have students that are really struggling with math i don't know if they could actually get the algebraic model uh organized enough to be able to find the solution to it but in the common sense life i think they could figure it out but doing it in the math uh, vocabulary or math expression i think that would be hard for them me i divided it myself i always tried to figure it out if i could figure it out myself and i know my go-to was okay what should it be and then can i do the math thing that's yes. where i'm at yeah it's it's very nice Yes. So here is an example of what uh, one student did uh, to solve this problem. And again, just think about it like my students in a problem like that, they would have difficulty just understanding the problem. What do you mean? Like me and then there's them and then why would I want to do this? And they, they start questioning everything to get out of making sense of it. But you're right. When they make tables, they, they find tricks sometimes they find tricks and they exchange like these tricks like how can I solve any problem like that that's just the questions like miss just tell me how to do this I don't want to think just show me how to do this and I'm like no stop reread highlight let me show you strategies right so getting to the model over here again and this is sec three so that means if you technically think about it this is something they've been doing problems like that 
I'm sorry, from elementary school. You've seen, this is technically stuff that I've seen my own children do in second, uh, not necessarily with algebraic models, but with like tables and counting and trying to figure things out, right? So. So have you seen something like that happens, you know, when you have like two, here we have two person and we should have like two models, but the, the student like took everything and put everything together, you know, he just like saw uh, like four numbers and, and he's like, okay, you know, let's do this because that's what I learned in math. Yes, Judy. Well, for me, it also comes back to the idea you said earlier about visualizing. So if you have the student, um, like, okay, who are we talking about? We were talking about the who, what, when, where there. Like, who are we talking about? We're talking about two people. So two people would give us two different mathematical models. So it, it's, it's also in how is the student visualizing the question? So right now, I think the student might just be focusing on what was highlighted. So it was like, pages is one variable, days is another variable. There we go. Let's make us, you know, something out of it where they didn't really grasp the idea of having two different people, so for two different models. Um, but I don't know how they would answer the question with continuing this way. <laughs> um, but we, you see that the student has a memory aid, but doesn't really understand the, um, like the concept behind what they wrote in their memory aid kind of thing. Like they will go straight to the function <laughs> or the, to the formula, like you said. Yeah, and, and, and the idea, I love what you just said, Julie, is the idea is they have, like you said, they recognize page, they recognize these, and they make two variables and plug and multiply. And, and like also Jessica had mentioned uh, in her, uh, like sometimes not even a slope, it's just like a plug and play and get something out of it in a, in a formula that somebody, and I remember like what you said at the beginning, you said pages and days. And this for them to recognize that is it's almost like almost mechanically taught that if you have two different things, that's your X, that's your Y, plug it in and call it a day. So actually taking the time of seeing, well, there's a relationship between this and this, you know, that is not even on the map. So yeah, Laura. Yeah, I was just wondering if maybe uh, writing this instead of one big paragraph into two paragraphs would help, where you have a paragraph for Raphael and then a second paragraph for Simon, just so that they see that there's two pieces of information. Uh, nothing, I'm sure that could help, sure. But, but yeah. would, you, would you think they'll be able to, to recognize that there's a relationship between these variables? that I don't know, but like this person just clumped everything together because it's one big paragraph. So maybe teaching them to, to even if you read it as a class and you put like a, a line to say, hey, look, two different people. Because I don't think they made the relationship that there's two different people here. Maybe, but uh, uh, maybe it's gonna help. But um, like w when I see like a student who does this, like th th this way of uh, solving a problem, I think he memorized the procedure, but he doesn't mm -hmm. understand why he's doing it. So he doesn't, oh, yeah. he doesn't understand like uh, the, the, the concept um, about it. And uh, you know, the, the first instinct when I read the problem myself was my first issue was the time here for me, you know, I was like, that's not going to be easy, you know? So I'm going to need- It started two days ago. That was yes, really- exactly. I, that, that's, a, that's a struggle for them. They don't like going back in time. Yes. And even for us, you know, it's like sometimes it's uh, not so easy, you know, to have like uh, tous ces repères uh, in mm -hmm. maths. So uh, uh, in, in uh, time. So yes, exactly. When it says two days ago and the first question that, popped in my head was uh, well like Julie said it in the beginning like uh, when does it start you know and uh, then I was like oh okay so um, it's a bit more it, it's a complex problem it seems easy but it's not so easy so it's uh, but it, it's good because it makes the, the student you know uh, you know develop some strategies and we have like to put the student like in uh, some problems where where we can Fair take enough. the time to learn that so so and so here yeah. if the, the student uh, is uh, 
did the mistake it's uh, mm -hmm. we're gonna have a discussion now <laughs> yeah but what i find is also interesting that you both brought up and even you laura it's you said that okay the visual uh is important but also this raised a question to me that the majority of our students how is their notion of time the notion of time like you all mentioned sometimes we think, oh, uh, well, they know, of course, they know their days of the week, they know their days in the year. But when you start referring in time, it's like, whoa, you destabilize them. So these are all interesting conversation, you know, to have. Yes, and, and this here uh, in the framework, uh, this we translated it, but basically what it says is if the transmission of tips technique and procedure is not supported by a thorough, thorough <laughs> understanding <laughs> of the concept at stake, it will allow the student to immediately succeed in application exercises, but will have significant repercussion in the medium and long term. So uh, in the presentation of the framework, they start with, uh, with this, uh, with this paragraph and basically they're saying that we want the student to understand the concept not just learn the procedure memorize it and uh, realizing the job like the, the the exercise on a short term short term and we've seen it you know in 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 class that uh, the student like they they do you know uh, exercise uh, we they repeat the same problem and then when they are in uh, confronted on a complex task they're like oh they don't know what to do and we're like okay but you've just done like one that is similar to this one but the student is not able to transfer because his understanding is very uh, en surface yes yeah it's uh, on surface there's no deep understanding yes yeah. uh, julie would you like to add something yeah well if we took off from the question let's say uh he started two days ago and we just asked the question if the book has uh, i don't know 360 pages who's going to be done first that would be a level two question mm -hmm. and being able to transfer or tra well, translate text into an algebraic expression should be something that they, like you said before, you know, can they transfer what they learned before to what they're doing now? So it shouldn't be something that's new. So we have to be uh, conscious when we're teaching new techniques, like here, finding the slope of a line, that we do the, uh, how can I say? progressive like we remind them the different things they can do for for solving a problem like it could be you need to translate text to a set uh, to an equation it could be you need to find the one equation it could be you need to find two equations so giving them kind of an idea of different types of ways to answer the question reminding them of things that they've done in the past so when we're teaching slope questions Sometimes I hate that in books where, <laughs> where you're like, ah, where does the question come from? We were just talking about slope and now they're doing this again. But I understand that the idea is to keep in mind all the other things that you've learned in the past. Like this is just one other way to solve the question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Michelle? Um, yeah, well, I, I was thinking about this too, as you guys are talking, and I definitely agree with this, this situation. And I, I've come to understand too, with like my students, individual based distance learning at home, um, they do the math help services program, they start with the, the explanation, the video, they can replay it, it's really well set up. And then they do the first two questions and like, oh, got it, all good. I don't need to go to the rest of the eight questions. And like the old program and this program, I realized that as they advance in the questions from eight to 10, or like, sorry, one to 10, there's been a transfer and they make the questions a little different. They change the variables. So uh, my students who have, are coming from like either adult students, like real adults or the young ones coming from the youth sector, they seem to not have those skills either. So I'm going back and I'm saying, well, why are you not getting this? Okay, let's go back. Oh, I didn't finish all the questions. So this is something I really find, find uh, hard because you, they want to take the shortcut and we have to go back and say, look, it's not a shortcut. You really need to do all these questions. And then if you're struggling, let's go look at it and see. So now I can track the live activity and see if they do a 
question to several times and then I can sort of intervene that way. But I think that they they don't want to do the work sometimes. I, I don't mean to limit them, but that's what I'm finding. There's the, especially they're like, oh, I was at secondary four in high school. Now I'm that two, you know, or, you know, so this is a big issue. So that's what I noticed to, to cue them for to do all the questions. And they also were in the habit of doing all the questions and not checking any of the answers. And then by the time they got to the bottom, everything was wrong. You know, even though they thought they understood it, they mm -hmm. couldn't exactly what you said. They could not transfer the knowledge to the learning as it progressed. So now I, I stop them all the time, make sure they check the things. So that's kind of where I, I really agree with this. This is pretty cool. You know, you know, which is interesting also, Michelle, that's one thing I notice also as a, okay, as, as a bad habit once upon a time I used to do is that whenever we have a student who also does something wrong and you remind them of things, but we spend more time on telling them, okay, write down how you did it but we don't go back and say, okay, what did you use to solve this? So maybe this is something, this is something that we should more focus, like sometimes that memory to be on how to versus to solve, because it is almost like, it's almost like a first impulse of just saying, yes. okay, I do this, I do this, I plug it in here, I you know, I, I, I isolate this and that, there you go. But it's not that the problem procedurally, even if you get it wrong, it's irrelevant. It's the how you got to get where you need to get that sometimes keeping track of those steps on, okay, I thought of this and sometimes it's easier to do it verbally when you ask them, oh, where did you go wrong here? And it's, oh, well, I did this, this, this. You understood where they went wrong and you say, okay, let's review this. But you remember we talked about this? You know, you question them and re-guide them. But I think for them to realize how they went about getting somewhere, I think on a longer term, becomes a lot more beneficial than getting the right answer or get it well actually celebrate the wrong answer because it kind of solved you <laughs> in two years uh, more yes. success but sometimes is that frustration of us too like I, I recognize yes. myself sometimes when I see a student who didn't get something right first thing is like let me show you let me tell you why and but sometimes for them to go back and say, okay, let me access to your way of thinking and say, okay, that way of thinking over there, it seems to be always problematic, right? So let's see another way of looking at it, right? Yeah, Julie. I totally yeah. agree with that. And I would like to add on, um, I'm coming back to that quote, if the transmission is not supported by a thorough understanding. And when I teach new concepts, I like to change the vocabulary. So I have a, a saying like there's the wizarding world like in Harry Potter and there's the muggles <laughs> that don't know. And then I like to compare like, okay, now and when we're doing math in our, in our wizard vocabulary, we say slope, but what does it mean for real? Like, what, is it, what does it mean to you in your language and your vocabulary? Or, um, you know, uh, what, what's an algebraic expression Okay, that's a very mathy way to say things. How does it sound for you in your real life? And and sometimes I'll I'll do a trick. Uh, when I was teaching uh, grade eight in high school back way back when, uh, when you had a proportion and you had to find the missing one, I would have them um, circle the two that are across, and it kind of made like a peanut, right? And then I say you multiply the peanut, you divide what's outside, and they didn't really understand the whole mathematical world of it, but they knew to make a peanut, multiply what's inside and divide what's outside. When they got to level three, the, the teacher put that kind of problem on the board and all my students went, you do the peanut. So <laughs> is, it, is it the right mathematical vocabulary? Probably not, but they remembered it all. And, and for them, it, they had the understanding behind it of why you do it that way. So um, sometimes it's worth, like it's important for them to understand the mathematical vocabulary, but also have the, tr the, the muggle translation with it 
that will help them know what to write down. So on memory aids, you have sometimes the students don't know how to make a memory aid. So they'll just copy whatever was on the math help services video or something. And they'll go, what does that mean to you? Oh, I don't know. What is it, why is it there? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Like, you have to understand what it means in your mind before you put it in. Because it does. it's not going to help you if you don't know what it means. So sometimes the like verbalizing what the concept is or the trip, trick or tip or whatever is you know, in their minds to know when to use it. Yeah, but also I've seen it also like later on, like just we have to be careful what you're doing is like great and they support that and they do that. But sometimes I've also seen students that come in and they wanna do the fish for everything. <laughs> because that's all they know. And that's where you have to say, okay, let's go back and reframe. This is good. Why? You have to kind of go read yes. the same process all over because otherwise it's going to be abandoned. All yes. Over. And you know, uh, sometimes the fish, you know, like you said, Michelin is an interesting concept. You know, sometimes we're like, no, they have to do it this way. But do they learn what's a coefficient proportionality? And sometimes, you know, when the student is confronted into the, the real world, they have to calculate fast and they're like, I don't have a calculator, I can't do it. And you know, but you know, th this number is 10 times bigger than the first one. So you should be able to understand that you just have to times 10 to get the answer, you know, instead of doing le produit croisé. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's those, those uh, 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 finesse that we want them to learn. So, but uh, as much as I love the conversation, we have to keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> and I just want to just uh, read something that uh, Jessica had wrote, but I'm, uh, but I also run into problem for uh, of of students uh, and my administrating feeling that I'm holding the student back in reviewing to make sure they understand. You know, <laughs> this is uh, this is a question that always comes back. Then you're holding a student back a little bit. It's like an investment. Sometimes you have to gain and lose a little bit to you know. So I, I, I'm going to just restrain in answering that one. But if the principals were pedagogue, we'll see the benefit. And sometimes you need to have many people supporting the student by making them understand that this is, if you don't get this here, you're going to stop somewhere else, you know, but this yeah. is another conversation. Yes. And uh, the, in this comment, uh, I like it because uh, I had like uh, many students who had uh, a lot of difficulties and the way I used to uh, work with the student is in this problem, you know, instead of taking the student uh, saying, oh, he needs to work out on his uh, fifth elementary school concept, I, I don't like, they don't like, you know, to feel like, oh, I, I'm not good enough, you know. So when they are in, in my class in uh, <clears throat> FBC sec one yeah. for example um I like to do it like you know a reverse uh, concept so in this problem of math what the student needs to understand is that 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 so I'm gonna work on that on those concepts that are related to what I'm working right now with the student so they don't feel like they're holding back but they feel like okay I'm doing something that I'm doing right now in math but I'm I'm still like working on the um connaissance anterior yeah. that needed to be worked for this uh, problem. Yeah. So let's move to the next. Uh, yes. uh, next. So here, for example, if we take the idea behind that problem that we just showed you and broke it down into these, these three basic concepts, like for example, if we take about we talk about conceptual understanding we're talking about unit trade similar value relationship between quantities rate of change so you see these this this idea could be broken into so many sub ideas in terms of flexibility here would be representation we're talking about chart mode table of value so you see when we said like level two you may go with a with a table value then level three we have two now registered like we have the chart and the table of value and of course when we're talking about flexibility we're talking about the concept of time also in this case the back and forth um in terms of fluidity that's where we find a bit of a bit of a wall and we have a hard time finding, uh, recognizing this one is then we, when we realize our students, uh, the, the, the day concept that there's 24 hours in a day, there's, there's minutes in an hour, there's seconds and minutes. So this whole, this whole 
basic concept, um, basic concept uh, being a day concept or notion of time, like when we're talking about average speed, um, you know, uh, what is an average speed? Uh, Wait, or, we're here it's because in the problem we had the, the word like they read uh, an average of pages in a day you know so the word average like you know mixed some student but it's it's used uh, very oftenly that uh, that word in average and here they don't have to calculate an average you know some student for them it's it's they just don't understand the the when we talk in regularly we use the word average it's yeah. a common language, so. Yeah, and 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 also, Julie, you had brought an, an interesting point before, like you say, you had the formal in class teaching vocabulary, and there's the regular, like their in world teaching, and notice that if they make probably their own lexicon, you know, of of what is let's say the word average mean, then they'll recognize these words in a lot of mm -hmm. places and they're able to understand it through the transfer that here average means the same as here, the same as here. It's just in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Notice that we have, there's four type of understanding that what we call intuitive, procedural, abstract, and formal. And uh, we spend a lot, we're really, really good in procedural and abstract and potentially formal also, but intuitive is our weakest. Um, and what we're talking about intuitive, we're talking about construction of an informal knowledge, mainly from sensory perception. So like, for example, when you say like by, I don't like to use the word gut feeling, but it's like by gut feeling, by just like seizing something and, and saying, well, it, it's, it looks like this, like for example, okay, how many, like we had this conversation yesterday and you say, well, how many pizza we need, you know, uh, to order for this party? Well, the first question will be, well, how many people? And then just by intuition, you could, you could see as well, people eat usually this conversation out loud. It's not mathematical. It is mathematical, but it's more like on intuition. Well, usually I eat two pieces. So therefore everybody eats two pieces. So I'm able to kind of do this based on my intuition. Uh, or, or for example, say, well, how far is something from you? Well, I think it's about, you know, this much. It's by intuition. It's based, again, based on your experience and based on what you, you think it's going to be, it's not measured. Again, procedural, of course, we're, we're really, really good in math um, in, in about that's the acquisition of procedures that the child can, or the child or the adult, that can uh, relate to his or her intu uh, intuitive knowledge and use appropriately that ideally what it should be is like once you predict something now let's go and make a procedure about it the abstract is of course construction of invariant and generalizing principles so because we've kind of proved it over and over now we have a like a kind of a rule or a concept and formal now we use technically the symbols and conventional procedure to put it together so this is the type of understanding um uh, the intuitive one i personally i can talk for myself is the one that i have the weakest in because I don't have the patience of waiting <laughs> and that is actually found among a lot of uh, a lot of us you know just give them time to to internalize without necessarily bringing the mathematical right away procedural and concept and symbols and and, and formal mathematics into the thing. That's for this. And again, so here, if we go back to the problems that we have when we're talking about rate of change, so intuition, how would you kind of practice that kind of um, uh, that kind of understanding? Could be by just simply giving them like sequences and say predict. What could be like complete that sequence? If you start four, seven, three, uh, 10, 13, 16, say, well, what comes after? Uh, deduct regularity, patterns. Um, use words that he knows, hourly wages, so if they're working, like, you know, estimate and compare, benchmark, return to unity, the unity concept. Uh, how many pages will Raphael have read the next day? So break it down, right? So this is intuition. So if today I read 30, well, what do you think tomorrow he will read? So by intuition, of course, what I read today, he'll read it again tomorrow, right? So this kind of conversation to build the, the, that type of understanding. When we get to procedural, we're talking about more like now, okay, let's organize the information in a table and bring out the good constant, the good constants. You know, what's good, what's bad, what we're gonna remove, what we're gonna keep type of thing. 
um, generalize that the constant, the good one that we're keeping, the regularity will allow him to determine the value. So here also to be skeptical on what you keep and what you don't keep. There's too much information. What do I keep as important information versus not important information? Um, has a mechanism to represent the situation. Draw points, make a table, make a graph. Again, it could be just tabulating who, who, like whatever method the student is using and where he's at, of course. And of course, manipulation. Let's use toothpick, right? Even though it takes a lot of toothpicks to do a problem like that, it doesn't matter, but just give them that option that they could have, they could use some people think with their hands. So give them that option too. So that's also for them to figure out a way, a mechanism for them to think. Now, moving to the abstract. Now we're talking about understand that when a quantity changes value, it has an impact on the other. So now we're talking about relationships, you know, between variables. Understand the role of parameters when the rate of change increases, you know, uh, the line in the graph will be more inclined towards the value axis. So is it steeper? Is it less? It's flatter. So this is where you start like now challenging their thoughts, you know, and eventually understand that the rate of change is a relationship between two quantities. But having it like by challenging, say, okay, now you understand one depend on the other. Now let's see what happened if I change this one. What happened what ha if I change this one? What's the effect on the other? And having that in multiple ways and then finally say okay now what do we conclude out of all of this process of thinking is actually saying well this one is a dependent on this one and this is how it's represented so the formal part that's how the students internalize it and then you could formally they did not the see the the last uh, column i don't know why but uh, it was supposed to be written in the formal one uh, the yeah, formula the for position. calculating the change of rate yeah. uh, here what's the interesting part is you choose a concept and then you analyze it with with uh, these four uh, type of comprehension and you know you figure out like what is like hard for the student to mostly understand so so here the the intuitive part in in usually in the problems you know what's the next one and that can be like uh work in many kind of different problem but the abstraction one the, the part that is very abstract for the student is the relationship between the quantities and when a student understand that that means he has very deep understanding of the concept so the idea is really like to look the overall of a concept and sometimes it's the formal part that is more hard and sometimes it's more the 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 abstract so by doing this uh, this type of ana analyze um we have like a, a bigger picture of what the concept really is about yeah and 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 also just to add to rita this is what i always had i find that was lacking in 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 our uh, in our field is the break down of a concept so taking an idea and break it down to into little pieces for the student to chew. And sometimes like the, the, the fact that we know math, we skip stuff. And this is normal because we're we're a lot, we're ahead of the game, right? But thinking differently about how you break something apart, sometimes you'll have yourself a deeper understanding of the B B B concept itself. Uh, when we did this exercise, <clears throat> have to stop and think at time. I know what rate of change is. It's a, it's a straightforward. I know what it means. I know all of that. And it made me stop and think, okay, how can I make my student think that way? I, I and, and it's through exchanges and stuff that I came across. I was like, yeah, we could actually do series. You're right. I could do series and I could build this knowledge this way. And by knowing how I could break down a concept in different categories like that, that's where I can also identify where my student has a hole also. So this this has two ways. You could deconstruct or you could build. And, and both ways, it helps you only, uh, it helps you help the student, helps you <laughs> as in recognizing where it falls and also techniques on how to build a, a concept that seems to be reoccurring all the time. Like my, my almost favorite uh, topic, isolating a variable. You know, in secondary five, we still have people can't isolate a variable. And this is something that should be 
known by that. But this is this is where you stop and say, okay, where is the issue? Let me go back and build it up again. So it's just my uh, my thought about that. Okay. So now, are we ready to move on to the next? <laughs> All right. So let's get you working a little bit how you feel about, if I give you something like that and I say, solve this, please. Go ahead and uh, solve this in any way you like. But yes, that's exactly what it is, is like there's many ways of getting, and when we're doing mental math, notice that everybody has a different tricks. If you understand how to add, properly, you find your own way of doing it. It's like, for, for example, something like this, 14 plus 20, all you have to say, okay, the 19 is too complicated. Let me round it up and then deduce one or saying, okay, 14 and 16 plus three, because I just like the four and six gives me 10, you know, or, or for example, yeah, change the, the change the format of the breakdown. But this is, this is the mental part, you know, A another way of like, you could say, well, 10 and 10, that going to give me exactly like somebody had mentioned the two tens that gives me 20. And then I add up the leftovers, you know, whatever way you do, as long as you recognize there's many ways to get to the same answer. And this gets done most of the time mental. You find your own little trick, you know, once you understand the concept of, of, of adding, addition. So when we're talking about flexibility, when we're talking about flexibility, this is where the, the flexibility component comes involved. So noticing different ways of adding two numbers and they're all right. It's just, it's, it's being flexible in our thinking. So determining different way of understanding, realizing and expressing one's understanding. So you just all demonstrated how flexible you are, uh, allows you to invent new procedure to perform a task that are unfamiliar or to find the most efficient way to perform a familiar task. And this is where the students have the power. Sometimes you may see a student when they're doing something and say, oh, this is so different. I never seen this before. And that is a form of flexibility in our thinking. And flexibility is a very, very important component because that's gonna help us uh, find other ways to be more efficient in doing something. This exercise, I'll let uh, Rita's favorite yes. exercise. <laughs> so, so <laughs> this example is uh, very interesting because it's, um, I took it from the referential, uh, the, from the presentation of the Mac uh, when he presented the, the framework. Um, so they asked like student to, um, to measure the blackboard and uh, one had like, you know, to measure uh, with the trombone and the other one with an eraser and the students were like, okay, but it's going to take me too much time. Like if I do it with the trombone, why are you giving me this one? And, uh, but you know, the teacher was like, okay, but do you think you're going to have the same answer? So, and they're like, no, we're not going to have the same answer. Like, you know, of course I'm going to have more trombone than, uh, than eraser, you know, cause the uh, trombone is bigger. So here they were like uh, teaching the student, the concept of uh, unit you know, that it's uh, depending on what you're measuring, the unit is important, you know, to choose the one, the, the good one. But here's another thing, uh, like he asked the student, you know, you're gonna measure from left and you're gonna measure from the right. So the student were like, but why are you making me measure from the left? And he is measuring from the right, you know, it's gonna be the same answer. So here the teacher is working the concept that distance, if you measure from left to right or from right to left, it should be the same. But, you know, for a student who the concept of distance is not very well understood, we're going to have in secondary four a student who's going to ask you, you know, when I measure from point A to B, is it going to be the same answer if I measure from point B to A? And now you're like, well, it's going to be the same measure because, you know, it's the same distance. And I'm sure like uh, many of you got this question from the student, you know, who ask you, can I measure from B to A or I ha always have to measure from A to B, you know? So here, the, the concept of distance is not very well understood for this student, you know, because he shouldn't be asking a question like that, you know? Yeah, and just to add to that, I've seen this in physics when we get to the concept between between like distance and uh, displacement, right? So again, you see the impact of something so silly that 
could have been like under once it's understood the repercussion all the way to secondary five and in the different disciplines too so so this is just to bring back sometimes it's like a simple application with deep understanding how much you could have solved along the way so i would like to um move forward and again how do we work this flexibility it's your questioning the art of questioning uh, and this is where it's super super interesting and super important to actually talk about mathematic during um mathematical questioning during uh, learning these conversation all right so let's see there's questions that you could ask before the task i'm gonna and these these are all um, you'll be able to have these as like even place in a classroom, right? So something like this, for example, oops, sorry. Okay, what tools will you need to do this assignment? Go back and think, what do I need to do this assignment? How long do you estimate it will take to complete this assignment? Have you ever seen a similar problem before? If you do, okay, pull it out and let's take a look. Uh, I present to you a situation that seems to me to be a challenge within your reach. So to prepare them, it is gonna be hard, but I know you can do it. If you want to search for information on the internet, what's the keywords to you? So teaching them how to actually learn. Uh, in what situation uh, your daily life will uh, have this type of problem? So related to something you know, and if you don't, that's okay, but just recognize that this could happen in real life. Would you like to start solving independently? Just give them, okay, you want to try alone and then have a friend or with me? Because sometimes, depending on the students, it might be a hinder. So if the students say, no, 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 I want to start with you. Okay, fine. Let's read it together, set it up, and then you go. Some other students say, no, 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 I want to do it alone. Some other people, no, I'm going to work with uh, with Giovanna. <laughs> Don't worry about it, you know? Um, the other thing is, would you like to see the answers before the procedure? So with you having the answers before helps you better figure out how to get to it. Some students they might say, yes, please give me the answer because they're so answer oriented and my work. So another type of question is during the task, if they come to you during the task, what kind of question you may wanna ask, uh, ask them? Again, here, I reiterate that this situation within your reach, so re-encourage, all right? Why did you decide to use this method? Just again, having this conversation, what do you mean by, why, uh, what did you notice when, do you, do you think this strategy would work in other situations with other numbers? So challenging them a little bit, that the strategy seem effective so far. So far you think you're on the right track and how do you know that that's true? Does it look like one you initially thought about before? You know, did you thought about that before and why not, you know, have this conversation? Is there another way to illustrate the reasoning or the procedure that you're doing? Uh, have you thought about all the possibility? Does this register make you think of previous situations seen in the class? So questions like that. But again, these are just sample questions. Um, there's a whole list of that. If you're interested, there'll be a reference in, at the end with the references. Um, now, thinking question during an obstacle. So let's say a student have difficulties in something in something and they're coming to you and they're stuck. What do you think, uh, what, do you, uh, what, uh, what, what do you understand in this task? What don't you understand in this task? So kind of reframe them again, bring them back to what they know, what they don't know. So by identifying what they don't know, then we're gonna go back to find out what's, what do they need to know? I am happy that you came to see me. And that on its own, sometimes students don't come and see you. So you have to recognize that that takes a lot of courage for this mathematical. Thank you for trusting me, reassuring them that that's one of the strategies of doing it. It's actually asking for help. And some of us, some of them have difficulty with that. What information are you missing to continue solving? So let's go back. What am I missing? What would make me solve that part? What resources did you use before asking me? So going back again for like making them more independent, recognize your lexicon, another adult, an explanatory video. Did you look? Did you try? Uh, what if we illustrated the situation with a drawing, with a graph, using other numbers? How would you like me to help you? Give you an example by writing for you, by naming the numbers or the steps. So let them tell you how they need the help. 
because sometimes we volunteer more than what we need to. And after the task, type of questions that we recommend is what, what tells you that you, your result is correct? So now we're going back and checking our work, right? What tells you that your, uh, that your answer or your, your results are correct related to the problem race? So, okay, what's the question of the problem? Did I answer it? Make a connection to the question because we have a tendency, some of our students just to go on automatically and start writing, right? Do you make connection with previous situations we've seen in class? What did you learn or discover today? If you had to do this again, would you use the same step? Go back over your step and think, oh, maybe I wouldn't have done this this way. Maybe I would have skipped that. Would you use the same approach? Uh, why did you persevere? Why did, why did you give up? You know, stuff like that. These are important because again, we're bringing them um, to realize that they stuck to it and they were able to succeed. And that's a success on its own. I'm glad you tried. I was convinced that you're able to do it. Uh, and I know it was hard, but you did it. So that encouragement again, to show them that this is the skill that we want. We want them to stick until the end. Can you explain the problem using another context? So, okay, now you just did it. Now recreate something for me, you know? Other numbers using another register. So challenging them to really see if they truly understood. How did you rate your approach? So like, if we take a look, okay, do you think this is the best way? Is it the most efficient way or it's just, it's fine. How do you rate your participation? How did you feel you invested? Did you put a lot of effort, a little bit of effort, too much was beyond. So get them to reflect on these things. It's very, very important. And it's a good opportunity to get them to kind of uh, uh, recognize their participation in the process and to see where they are and where they're going. Um, again, in there, um, the different way of understanding and imagine a task, uh, it is also um, the students who determine the new way, allow the student to develop the most optimal or efficient solution that students justify why. So here, it's also, it's important for us to help, but in, in support of their need, not for, we have a tendency sometimes just to jump in and want to save, but sometimes that's not what they need. They need just like maybe just one or two information to move forward. So that's for that. Uh, so when yes. we talk about fluidity here, we're talking about quickly visualizing and mobilizing good knowledge, uh, good knowledge um, works through structured activity when the intention is known by the adult to automate the knowledge and concept to be mobilized and frees up cognitive space. So again, if, if we go back to our problem before that we see, if the student is familiar with the concept and truly understand the concept of time, it would have not been um, an obstacle. It would have actually just helped the problem move along. So, so by having specific, well, specific, having some concept thoroughly understood, it became almost like it becomes like almost like a lever to move forward. It won't be an obstacle. So, fluidity is a very, very important uh, also component in the um in the understanding in in the understanding and the moving forward of mathematics so i i love i love this <laughs> i am fluent when i have experience and i understand what i'm doing so now if we go back to our previous example that we had started off with if we go uh, down and break it down into the um the three components what would be here a conceptual uh, understanding uh, challenge, what would be here uh, a fluidity challenge, and what would be a flexibility challenge that you see? What I think is that uh, in the first, uh, when we showed you this, we all had a good instinct because we all named uh, everything, you know, uh, we named that the student here, he knows the algebra, so he knows the mechanics, but he doesn't know, he doesn't understand why he's doing it, what, what it means. Uh, we see here that the student is very fluid in the algebra, but his understanding, conceptual understanding of the, the, the concept of comparing two equation is not very well understood. So I think it's now that after seeing what's written in the framework, I'm able to put words on, on how to analyze this kind of uh, answer. answer from from the student uh i actually don't mind the solution at all because 
like it's a way to get to the answer. So I like the idea of fluidity where, um, no, the other one, anyway, the one more flexible, flexibility, where we can let the students figure it out however they want to figure it out. And I think that sometimes we're, well, for me, sometimes I, I don't always think of how flexible it should be. I just go, here's the easiest way. Like always use this easiest way, but yes. they don't have to follow that way. They can, you know, they think how they think and that's great. And that's why I like in the uh, final exams now, there's a little other box. <laughs> yes, yes. And I, I use it often because, uh, I mean, the student might not have the, the correct answer, but they used a reasoning that made sense to me um, and mathematically. So, I mean, I'm, if, that, if the student can, can make it to this, like it makes the work way more complicated, but with the algebra skills there, okay, sure. <laughs> yes. Like, that. But uh, just asking like this, and uh, it's, would you put excellent to this work or would you put like very good, you know? I would put incomplete because- Incomplete. No, no, I mean like for the first part only because we don't um, have the last part, but the beginning, you know, would you put excellent or would you put, it's, it's a tough question because me, myself, I ask myself this too, you know? Like, what do I do when a student does that, you know? Do I put him, he didn't do any mistake, you know? Do I put him excellent for that? Or, you know, I kind of ask myself, you know? We can't put and, no excellent, like there's no reason why we can't put excellent for, for the beginning because like you said, there's no mistake and doing the comparison method with the Y variable instead of the X variable is not a problem. It's just not the easiest or fastest way to get to the answer, but it's not a problem. There's nothing wrong with yeah. it. So if but the, uh, if yes. the exam had that, the, the perfect, like the fastest solution, I would go other and then that solution would fit. So I don't, yeah. with the yeah. idea of mathematical reasoning, it's just fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe. But here for me, like I see like there's something I need to like understand more about the student and you know, because he didn't, he, he chose uh, in method efficace, but not efficient, you know? So he did like, th this way of doing things uh, took him to the answer maybe, but it wasn't the best way of going to it. And when I like to make the student compare the way of doing it so they can, you know, uh, see that there is efficient ways of doing things. And it's gonna make their life easier because you know the more it's it's good to work that with the student. I totally agree with you. And me, when the student does that, I'm happy because I'm like, okay, now I can work something with the student. So I confront him to other with other student and I tell him, how could you do it differently? Do you think it's the best way to go to it? And I want him to understand that, oh, I could have make it simpler and going through a simpler uh, solution sometimes means less mistake because the more complicated, the more possible way of mistakes we can do, you know? Like for example, if I, I, I travel in my own town or if I go, you know, uh, I, I, I drive for like five hours, um, maybe I have more chances of having a ticket when I drive for five hours than I drive for like an hour, you know, because I'm more on the street. So, so, and I'm like, you know, even you being the best as you can, but you don't know, like accidents sometimes happen and stuff like that. So the longer the, the solution is, sometimes it's the, the less efficient way, it's, hmm, you know, maybe the student can make mistakes or, or not, but you don't know that. So I think here it's, it, me, it tells me I need to work more with the student about about this i like it but of course like you said he didn't do any mistakes so maybe he understands super well and he was very stressed out and he just did it like that because he learned in class that he has to isolate the, the why when he uh, he does the comparison so yeah so I, so I think it's it's, it's just challenging you know i'd like to come back to one of michelin's uh uh previous workshops that i so loved about language uh, disorder and uh, in that workshop, we learned that if we have a student that has uh, any type of language disorder, 
they if they understand one thing one way and they do it right that stick way to it. stick to it and so for here like i said the student might have it might have been the way that they learn how to use like how do i solve a system of equations put y equal put them equal to each other and if that's the way it works for them good is there a place for tons of errors yeah of course it's way harder but but there's nothing mathematically yeah. wrong about the solution and the fact that the student, like if we look at the competencies, understood what he had to do, use the correct math, mathematic concepts. And if you get to the answer, good, but that's not the most important part. So to oh. me, that student would get all their marks. Like we're not, we're not evaluating. Like if we talk about math reasoning together for the fun of it, yes, like go about efficiency. Uh, but if we're evaluating, we can't evaluate, well, how fast do you get to the answer? because that's not where we're supposed to evaluate well, we're supposed to evaluate that they yeah. have a reasoning to get there if you go back uh, Micheline the previous uh, I like what you're saying and I love it because it's challenging and you know it, it's those kind of discussion that we want to have as a team not too fast uh, just go back to flexibility uh, so you see uh, it allows the student to perform a task that is unfamiliar but also sometimes to find the most efficient ways. And I agree with you, Julie, sometimes it's okay, it's perfect. But sometimes I think like here for me, did he understood the concept very well? I don't think so because he doesn't understand that he didn't have to go through all this process, you know? Yeah. He just understood the mechanics. So for me, he didn't go enough far, but there is no right or wrong answer. I don't know until I see the student, you know, in other tasks. To, to know, you know? Yeah. So it's it depending on every student. So, yeah. but it, it gives me like a design this, you know, to see, oh, maybe I should dig more with this student. Uh, Michelle? Uh, yes, okay. So it goes sort of, uh, I'm glad you followed up with the flexibility because then it goes back to the original thing about choosing the tool. So for me, with my students, I try and give them an example. There's a lot of ways to bake a cake or to prepare a cake. You can choose a screwdriver to stir. You can choose a fork. You can choose a spoon and you can choose a blender. And one of them will be quicker and more efficient than the other one, but they kind of still stir the cake, but not to the best thing. And I use that to help them understand that there's definitely different ways to solve it. And that, you know, that's a good, you know, like that being able to be different and different languages. And then I wonder sometimes when, you know, you've taught them these different ways or to be more efficient, um, and then they get into the testing environment and it's very stressful. They tend to fall back to what they feel secure with and they use those, those strategies. And yeah, I don't think like, I, I think about, like Julie said, I don't think, I think that it's an excellent way to solve it because they still under the pressure of testing, they still found a solution to solve what they needed to do, but they may not have completely mastered um, the whole idea of how they can do it more efficiently and with practice and time. So that's where, sorry, I just wanted to go and say that there. Thank you. I would like to add something. I would like to uh, just go back to the point that remember the student in the front of you is unique, right? Is unique and there's no uh, one shoe, one size fits all. So if the student in the front of you, you gives you a solution like that this is a super opportunity to have this communication open and to recognize you know your student best if your student happens to be this to them is the best way and this is what they know and they are you know their background you know their history and personally a student with a language difficulty a student with any difficulty give me a solution like that i'll celebrate it because they got that far and honestly, I will give them excellent and plus plus because to them, there's so many challenges in the way and their reasoning, they're able to find a strategy for them to survive and to get there and to make more logic of it. So go ahead. Of course, this is a specific student's profile. But if we take other students who, could, who are capable to go further, that's where, yes, I totally agree. You challenge them, you get them further. And that's that's the part where you're right, Rita, that's where you, you have this as an opportunity to have a conversation. But the evaluation part, if I go to the evaluation part, my checklist is checked and they're all correct. They're able to show the, the reasoning. They're able to show a way of solving. They're able to get to the answer 
and they're able to explain to you with some logic to it that is mathematically sound. Of course, efficiently is great if the student is, 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 can be challenged and is willing to challenge. But if let's say at this level, I'm looking for this, 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 I think this is great. And they check my checkbox if for evaluation. During the learning process is a different story. The learning process, you push them as much as they can. And this is where the zone of approximate, you know, like the, 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 the zone of learning comes in and, and you challenge them to their limit. But again, again, this is a conversation and this is not a generalized approach. This is, again, it's, it's, you have profiles in your head that you know this would be great for and others know you will want them to do more you know so so yeah this is this is this is just interesting it's i find it it's just it, when we have the word evaluation here taking away from you know what the students could 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 even do further but, but definitely i i always i i agree with both of you rita and julie some students who are super strong give me something like this i'll say ah, i'm sorry you could do better go ahead but other students i know this is great oh man i'll celebrate this you know, so, but it's an opportunity to have this conversation because this is where you get the chance to get to know your Susan more. And even by showing them other alternative, I think you're just opening their mind, but to them, you could say, it works for you, stick. If this is something they can do, you know, but other profile, you say, no, I think you could do more. And that's where you can push them. But I do agree, under pressure, <laughs> people go back to reset mode. So we want to make sure that reset mode is correct. If it's mathematically sound, that reset mode, we're good. If it's not, that's where we really have to go back and try to find ways to kind of fix or support. Fix is, is a big word, but more support and kind of uh, um, hopefully convince that <laughs> this is not necessarily the best way to go about it. Yeah, Giovanna? I think you articulated it very well, but I feel like I, I go back to the way you started the, the presentation with the not. So I think, like you said, to know your students, I mean, I'm not a math teacher, but I'm just saying like that not concept is very uh, salient for me because, you know, for the students that are not going to go very, very far up the mountain, you know, the not it's safe, but the ones that are want to go a little bit higher, well, we're, we're going to need to strengthen their not, their, their not skills so that they won't get into trouble later. So I think the fact of knowing your students and, and, and knowing like how far up the mountain they wanna climb is a, a pertinent place to start so that they have, you know, that, that solidity. Like, so that's, that's for me made it very, very salient. Thank you. So it's nice sometimes just to go back a step and show your student that your brain is made, there's no such thing as math brain or French brain or English brain or, Chinese brain. It's just a brain that we all have, and it's the same for everybody. It's just it has certain areas that is more um, trained than others. And if you happen to be weak in math, it's because maybe that part of your brain wasn't trained enough, wasn't on a treadmill long enough or jumping rope enough. So this is why you come to math class to get the chance to get them to exercise. So that muscle improve and increase so by going back over uh those kind of conversation with the student and kind of break down that stigma around oh i don't have a math brain i have a math brain it's more like saying we all have the same brain and we just need to work some area of it more than others and it's important to work all of that so that's it and exposures of course influence that too so that brings us here when we're talking about here um um, the three concepts. So for example, you have a function like f of x equal to x plus three and how we break it down into conceptual understanding, fluidity and flexibility. So Rita, if you wanna explain this. Uh, well, it's, it's just another example, but uh, like uh, you, we, uh, we've, like you, we've seen it many times uh, now today, uh, but uh, actually the idea is just to, when we uh, we ask a task to the student, you know, we can like uh, analyze it from the perspective of conceptual understanding, fluidity, and flexibility, and then we can, you know, if we decide today that we're like focusing on, you know, the con uh, a flexibility, for example, or a fluidity, where we're gonna like um, choose a ta uh, choose the question accordingly, so to the to our intention. 
So it's, it's just an idea of breaking down a concept into it, into these three categories and say, okay, if my student needs to work one more than the other, how to, to practice these? Yes. So. And it's good to have like those conversations as a team, you know, because uh, we're, we're all working with teams and, you know, we've seen it here today, like uh, how the conversation are like so rich and so uh, like full of ideas and everything. So, so basically that's uh, what's proposing the framework is, you know, to discuss mathematics with our teams differently. So here is an activity that we're going to do together, uh, not together, but uh, in uh, small teams. So I think we can go in three uh, breakout rooms because we're not uh, a lot. And um, here, the pedagogical uh, intention of this activity is to discuss mathematics with uh, colleagues uh, by referring to the mathematical uh, intervention from framework. Uh, also, uh, the objective is to reflect on our teaching practices so we can, you know, uh, when we choose a concept, we can like say, okay, we do it like this regularly. I know it's hard for the student, you know, because I've seen them, you know, uh, find it hard. So how can I now look at it in a different perspective and, you know, uh, intervene with uh, in other ways that I usually do? So what we would like is just you pick a level, uh, a module, like whatever it is, let's say 2101, whatever course you want, or a concept. You could pick a concept like a fraction, fractions, or whatever you want, pick a concept and break it down into these, through, uh, break it down into these three categories. How would you break it down into um, the components for conceptual understanding, flexibility, fluidity, for, uh, for example? I hope uh, this activity got your uh, blood flow. <laughs> I, I find it went good. It was a good, good, a good helper. And uh, Reed, who was awesome and uh, trying to help uh, me to get my message where it should go. <laughs> so that was good. And then the support of, uh, yeah, the rest of this. Yeah, it was good. Thank you. It was a good experience. Giovanna, how was it? Uh, for me, it was uh, interesting. Uh, like I, I, I that can't necessarily contribute in terms of like the experience of what I never taught math. Um, but it was interesting. Like um, Michelle was talking about, like she was taking um, a kind of an inventory of like divergent thinkers, and that's you know being a divergent thinker. I think that's pretty cool because that helps. You know, if, if they compare strategies, I think it would make the concepts uh, more concrete uh, because like for me, just being in this workshop is like there's an anxiety that I cannot explain. And I could just imagine like the students that I they just have links that have they missed some links, you know, having that opportunity to share with other students their strategies or how they go about solving a problem or what they understand from it that could that could solidify concepts in a, in a real way like it's not teacher talk you know so, so yeah and and laura when did you think yeah no it was good it was good okay okay good uh, jessica and julie i know you jessica's in class she's doing she's double duty she's being a teacher and she's being a participant <laughs> but it's okay my students are late so I, I find it very, like, just like my students, right? When I hear something and I wasn't paying attention, so I didn't catch everything, but the concept solidify more once I get to practice on it. So yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. And Julie, what did you think? I think some of these things we do uh, as a reflex in class, like we don't necessarily categorize our thoughts when we're teaching. <laughs> But I know that when I can do a stand-up lesson, I will automatically go to like the fluidity first. Remember, <laughs> you know, this, 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 this. Now I'm going to go into this, 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 this. Um, but on the flip side, someone brought up Math Help Services. I think it's Michelle. And I use Math Help Services as well. And they are really concept-based. So the, and sometimes they break down the question too much. Like I have called John and said, why are you still explaining fractions in the middle of this level five question? <laughs> um, but so it's important that we, like at this point now, I kind of know math help services like the back of my hand. So sometimes I'll be like, okay, before you start these, come see me, you know, <laughs> we need to 
we like to we need to look back at certain concepts before and the other thing i like to tell them is if you get a different answer than what math helps services does as a solution if you get if you get a different solution don't erase it to copy what they said because i don't care about what they do i want to see what you do please come see me with your solution we'll talk about how it went so even if you got it wrong maybe you got it wrong but the think the thought process is correct uh, and it's tough for them to to think like that when they've been programmed to find the right answer like the new generation growing up like my kids are 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 not so eager on getting the right answer They're like look mom i did so well i'm like yeah you got the answer wrong and you're happy about it i'm like so <laughs> like it. um and now bringing this new flexibility to them is like it's not all about the answer it's about well, your thought process and uh and it's nice to be able to bring that out to the students so we, I think we do those three things. Um, I, I don't know how to say that, but like normally when we're teaching, but it's nice to think about having these three categories when we do. Yeah. Uh, well, personally, I find it's interesting when we mechanically stop and think, because like, like Julie says, we do them. But when we stop and think okay this is this this is this and this is this it brings a different twist to it i find personally because if i i never think okay now time out everybody we're going to just practice flexibility time out everybody we're going to do just but now knowing this that if somebody gives me a solution now i'm able to say okay this is great let's work this component because it seems you always seem to have a mistake here with fraction so let's go back to that fluidity component and let's go back in time, right? But now identifying it, it's not, oh, he doesn't like, oh, I don't understand everything. So you can bring back to the point of the student and say, oh, you, you are capable of doing this, 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 but maybe you did not quite understand that specific thing. And that gap here, it has an influence on everything else. So let's work on this. It's not, I don't want you to move forward, but we have to fix what's not solid or not fix, more like we wanna solidify what's not solid. It's more like that. We, we don't wanna fix anybody. We wanna just bring them the right tool to help themselves because I need help then, <laughs> you know? So yes, Julie. Uh, it, it, I just thought of um, a lot of our students who come from high school, so my younger ones, um, who have oftentimes been bumped mm -hmm. in their levels and now they come to us. They, like someone said earlier, oh, I was in level four and now I'm in two. Um, they've been bumped up. So a lot of the fluidity is absent. Like there, mm -hmm. there are certain com concepts that they, they don't, they haven't integrated yet as a, as a, it's like they're missing letters in their alphabet. So they, they talk funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I love it. It's you true. know, so they're, they're missing sounds and you're like, what are you saying? Um, but there's some things there. So when I do, let's say a placement test to see what they do remember, I call it a placement test, but I don't really place them. It's just, I, I want to see what they remember. I'll see parts of algebra. I'll see some type of something with fractions. I'll see some type of, and I'll see a little bit of knowledge coming back to haunt them, you know, like, oh, I've seen this before. That must be something. And then like, they will use the slope formula for some things that have no relationship <laughs> But they remember the slope thing, like the teacher really drilled the slope thing into their head. And, and it's to sometimes to really take a, take, go back and say, okay, before we can look at this new knowledge, we really need to go back and solidify this or go back in time. Just, just this week, I have a student who doesn't, who didn't know how to calculate integers on a calculator, how to put a num number being negative. So all his answers were wrong because he never put like negative 10 was just 10 all the time oh so he felt like he knew nothing and he was not good at math and he could never do it i'm like well if if that's the case right next i'm not going to go back and teach integers to you okay no. <laughs> but i at least know how to punch them in your <laughs> 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 you know how to put negative 10 and that is different it's two different things so it, sometimes it's little little details Little details, we have to really be uh, detectives to catch. Like, why are you getting yes. all things wrong? Like, you're doing algebra fine. Why is yes. <laughs> You're so right. And Julie, uh, you said something uh, in your first comment that I really like about the mistake. And the way you work in it, it's, it's like it's good because it did dramatize the mistake. 
and we learn by making mistakes too. So it's an opportunity for us. So now we're having like a group of students who usually are scared of doing something in math just because they're scared of getting it wrong, you know? But you're like, no, it's like, I'm gonna provoke the mistake and I'm gonna make them like fall in my trap. So I'm gonna make them like, you know, I'm gonna work on the real issue here and we're gonna have fun while, while we're doing it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's, it's a good thing that you brought it up. You know, I, I forgot about it, like the mistake, but I, it's a, it's, it's a good process to go through when you were learning, learning, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, Michelle. Okay. So I have a, it's kind of a question or a comment, but I'd like sort of your opinion on it. Like when I get new students and that whole issue, like Julie was saying about they're at four, four, but you get them at two. So I do a little trick with them and I ask them to tell me the Great Lakes. 90% of them can't do the Great Lakes. So then I give them, okay, homes, uh, the, you know, the mnemonics. So here in Ontario, Michigan, Erie Superior. So they, they, for some of them, it can actually take them quite a long time to understand that. They kind of get it. They finally are able to reproduce it for me within that day. Some, it takes a couple of days. And then we go back to like, okay, you filed it away, short-term memory. Now we're going to access it. So two days later, I ask them, okay, can you reproduce the, you know, the Great Lakes for me? Okay. Then I start realizing that they actually can't recall even the filing system or the yeah. trick to learn it and so now like I, I, I this is where I'm saying is this a question of the fluidity or the you, you know because they then they start the math and then they're like okay they're going through the, the things and yeah yeah I'm getting it I understand it and then poof like it's all gone and so this is like a where does that fall and what happens with that like is that too big of a question or I don't know yeah Michelle, I love this question because this is something me and Rita, we talked about yesterday. And I said, you know how people throw away road work and they say, oh, road work. It's not, it's for that. Again, just to go back to fluidity. Once you understand something enough, it doesn't matter what, later in time, over in time, whatever, you're able to bring it back. But that's true understanding, thoroughly understanding. But when you're talking about recall of procedure, recall of something, that's a different story. That's a very different story because you're right, short-term memory, long-term memory, executive functioning, that's a whole ball game altogether, right? So root work for some students are really, really, it's really, really important. And I know I actually had spoken to some people, they're trying a pilot project where they do, um, uh, mental math every morning, five minutes for the past two months. And that it, and it's just everybody in the classroom, it's an individualized setting, everybody stops, we're doing five minutes of road math. And at the beginning, obviously, you could see not many people started well, but now because it's repetition, 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 again, it's like a muscle, right? You practice. Some, of course, they're born like my son, he, he has a disorder, so that muscle, forget it. <laughs> he needs support, he needs a memory aid all the time for specific things. But other people who unfortunately maybe did not get the chance to practice that muscles, these kind of rote work are useful for it. But again, everything with intention makes sense. If we do things just because we wanna do things, if I repeat, if, if I know how to add, I don't need 50 examples of addition for me to show you I know how to add. I did it. I showed it to you. So road work there is useless. But if something I need, like I need them to develop a certain thing and, and it, it's hard for them, that road work comes in handy. But again, anything with purpose, it's justified, right, in a way? Yeah, Julie, you wanted to add? Well, first of all, Michelle, thank you so much. I feel less alone. <laughs> um, to me, in, in my little world, in my bubble here where I am, um, I see the same situation happen and I try to put my finger on the problem. Sometimes it's a learning difficulty. Sometimes it's, it's like dysphagia. There are some students with uh, like short-term memory difficulties. I have some students with such intense ADHD, you know, like the type that you think maybe medication is a good idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that that like that have a such a hard time functioning just in a classroom setting. 
so anything you give them is such a hard, hard task. And I've been trying to um, uh, enrich my own understanding of ADHD and how to help those students. And I'm learning a lot about that and how they how they think and how they can or cannot process depending on what's going on. Um, but there, there are some of those students who are with us in adult education because of these learning difficulties and that they were never, um, I don't want to say properly addressed because they might have been, but they, they're difficult to overcome. So what we have to find is strategies to help those students. And on, on the flip side, I have the students um, who are adults who function just perfectly fine in life. They're just coming back to us because they want a different job and they'll need a different level of education. And they're going through our math going, well, I, I, I don't ever use this, you know? <laughs> yeah. So if you, for example, if you asked me to pass the level four English exam in the uh, adult ed the level, I probably wouldn't be able to pass it. And the reason why I say that is that our English teacher said she wouldn't be able to pass it just coming off the street. And she's Anglophone and she's been to university. But some, some content is still specific to this, to this course that you have to have been trained in those different concepts to, to be able to pass the exam. So I give some of the questions like, how much will it cost for gas? Well, they're like, duh, you know, like, I know I've been driving my car, I've been filling it up. Um, so why do I have to put an X in there? <laughs> so some of the, some of our, our students will have to learn to conceptualize, learn to ab do abstract things. It's, it's, I find it very, very difficult um, for both categories of these students where, where either they can't remember or they can't, they can't make sense of it or they just can't concentrate long enough to remember anything. And the students who are like, why are we doing this? I, <laughs> I can't figure this out differently. Um, so that it's, it's really my life right now, trying to figure out how to help these students. And like, like uh, Michelin said, they're, they're all very um, unique you know, each one has a story. Right. Like there are some students with deep, deep baggage and then they come to our classroom and we have to demystify what's going on in their brain. And in uh, and, and some situations, it will be something like that where you just have to, to get the PTSD out of them. <laughs> for, yeah. for math or, I failed so many years, you know, what's going to be the difference here? Mm -hmm. So it, we, we are kind of be, we are asked in adult ed to be, um, very good at, at finding where the problem is. So there's there's finding a solution, but sometimes we don't even know where the problem lies. So finding what the yeah. actual problem is, is 90% of our job, I think. <laughs> yeah. But Julie, what you're saying is super interesting. And I'm going to call this, uh, what you just mentioned, it's called the uh, uh, mental overload. That's also the problem. They're coming in already like a surcharge mental, like we say, already they're on mental overload and we're coming in with like, we're going to feed them more. And it's unfortunate, but this is something else. It's like, how do we discharge these students a bit mentally so we could teach them? You cannot teach someone who's on overload, right? You you put yourself in their shoes. You, you like overload yourself mentally, emotionally and all, and then come into a classroom and let's see what you're going to remember, right? So, well, Again, everyone's unique. We try our best. We're, that's why we're, we're, we're building our, 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 our toolboxes to the best of our ability. And that's why these, these conversations are important because what works for one might help someone else, right? So these exchanges are important. So that being said, let's go back and do some more math. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's very enriching and you're not alone. And by the way, just to reassure you, I've been to so many centers, so many school board, and it's a common conversation. Our, our, your clientele is the same clientele across. The differences in some places, is just cultural. Some places is more, uh, it's the same profile everywhere. Unfortunately, the students are coming into adult ed is young and have uh, lots of holes in their learning. The older ones have a lot of overload on their shoulder and baggage. The ones who can't learn suddenly wants to learn. And anyways, everyone's unique and you're trying your best and you're doing great. Listen, you're here today, right? <laughs> you have uh, Laura. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a quick question. It's not really math related, but I was just wondering, 
if you guys were in similar situations since we're all here. Uh, so me and my colleagues in all subjects this year, we're finding the students are so unmotivated. Like yeah. they don't wanna come to class, like more than usual. They come to class, they don't do any work. They sit there, it's, it's yeah. I was just wondering if it was just our center, <laughs> if you guys were experiencing no, it too. I, I, it's the same everywhere, I think, because uh, we have like so many issues in the, uh, like the cell phone is just a big problem too, you know, like, uh, is it so much fun to do math? It's more fun to stay on my uh, cell phone. Uh, the books are boring. Uh, the students have a uh, bad experience in mathematics. So their relationship with uh, math is uh, really not so good. So they're really, it's, the motivation is is really hard and sometimes even like the language in the they have difficulties in the language so they are in math class where they have to you know use the language they have to communicate well too so it's another obstacle so yes the motivation is is something that i think when we look at our group like we have to see how we can activate the brain of the student when he comes into the class so he can start working and uh, I associate it a lot with like physical training. When we go to physical training, we uh, we do réchauffement before we start working out. So when we come into a math class, so like uh, Micheline said earlier, an example of someone who's doing uh, calcul mental in uh, every morning. So just this five minutes where the brain is exercising, it's starting to work in math. Uh, we have Julie who said like she did dramatize the mistake, which is like there by doing that the student is developing a better relationship with mathematics, and sometimes you know the book is, it's the books are good but sometimes they get bored like we're not gonna lie to ourselves they get bored in the books so we have to think of other ways of working with the students so they can get motivated and we have also the cell phone who is like really fun you know and easy access for them so so we have to we have this issue too to you know to uh to think about it so uh so but it's a very good point that you brought up laura because yeah uh, I think that's the biggest problem I have right now. It's just motivation. They yeah. they they don't come. They don't work. They don't. Yeah. You you say okay. I want you to practice this. They get up. They leave instead. You know, like it's just. I feel like it's a lost cause. Like, and then as a teacher, I'm losing motivation. <laughs> yeah. It's it's it's, it's yeah. not pretty. This, but, this year is uh, particularly bad. Yes, but uh, now we're getting like to the second part where we're gonna have more fun in the 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 yeah. workshop, uh, and uh, we're gonna see like how we can twist things so it it can be more fun a bit. Uh, yeah. We had the uh, Giovanna who had her. Yeah. I had. I, was, uh, I wanted to to speak to Laura's point. I mean, motivation is is a constant issue with not only in math. I mean, math anxiety could be it, but. I mean, I see it also in general that oh, yeah, yeah. everyone's a little bit apathetic right now, like it's fed up. So one of the, you know, what Michelin was talking about earlier about like that rote piece, like that could be a routine that's integrated, but also like, you know, I don't want to sound like, you know, pro Home Depot or anything, but like little moments of like mindset work and, and sharing your own thing. Like, cause I don't know how, like, are you excited to go to work when no one is motivated? Like it's the same thing, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard. At the beginning, you are, but you know what I mean. It's like you know, I need to keep you it. to motivate me because I'm not motivated if you ain't motivated. So, um, you know, giving that moment of like let's let's address this head on, and let's make it like valuable for both of us. Like I get your apathy, and I get your you're not motivated, and I'm not motivated. You're not motivated. So how can we integrate that? Just a little piece of your time just so to integrate that routine like part of like that rope like you have that like little piece so that you go a little bit back just to go a little bit further because otherwise it's to say plat pour tout le monde you know yeah. Yeah. it's just a little strategy that I'm trying to do no I'm, I'm gonna just add a small thing on uh, what Giovanna said I recently was at a conference and um one thing I was list because I was among a bunch of teachers and pr principals from the elementary level 
And they were complaining about the same thing. And they were saying that there's more and more one main issue among a lot of the, the students right now is there's a language issue because there's less stimulation from the age of one to five. A lot of kids right now are being put on, hooked on all these electronics and there's less of that connection with the parents. And that is being translated into the classroom. These kids are coming in with major, major language issue. So just to build on what Giovanna was saying, there's a COVID after COVID, it seems, and I know it seems repetitive, but this COVID is mental health. And personally, to motivate students at this point, your best bet in math or French or English or whatever course you're taking is to create a connection among themselves, to create that spirit of community because they need it. They need it. They've been isolated for too long and they want to feel they're not alone. And if you could go through, like if we take a look at the uh, brains, there's three brains. There's the survival brain, there's the limbic brain, and there's the executive brain, if you want. And if you're always in survival mode or emotional mode, there's nothing happening in the front. So these kids right now, they're stuck on those other modes. And, and again, I'm not a psychologist, and I see it from my own children. They're not motivated. I have to like pep them up. So I don't know if this might help creating another like another reason why they should come to school and sometimes it could be just being in the spirit of community and also mechanically create ways to get them to succeed like I used to always create little assignments where I know even the silliest person in the class can pass it is that having that reassurance that you could succeed again might you know or maybe give them a trade okay let's do today a video game uh, like for half an hour, we could compete or some sort of something, something, but the spirit of community, the spirit to come for someone else than math or me, it might create, regenerate the vitality of a class. And I believe me, I don't like if, as, if I was a kid, I would not want to come from my subject that I failed a million times, but I want to come from my friend that suddenly I met and we share something together. And that I know it's hard, it's outside of math, but again, we're looking at a wholesome approach a community approach feel and that's where retention in my past life it worked <laughs> because I worked so hard on creating team community and sometimes I took a lot of time off the map but that what made sure that these kids stayed till the end and yes they were behind but you know at the end of the day they showed up and they're ahead from one if they would have left the first or second week. So again, this is me, my personal side note. I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a therapist, but this is more like of what I experienced and what helped me. So if that helps. Yeah, Julie. I agree with the whole community feel. It takes a it takes a whole school board to raise a kid. Yes. <laughs> um, some students don't don't know what they want to do in the future and sometimes I don't get any work out of some of the students until they figured out what they want and all of a sudden ooh, this is what I need to do what I want oh oh okay and then <laughs> so we have a program at our school that's called uh, social vocational integration and we've started that at our school and it has transformed some of our students because now they are doing stages in different places that interest them and they're going oh well I would actually do this for the rest of like this is a job I'm interested in for real and then they come back to math class with like eagerness to get it done mm -hmm. and and it, it's really yeah I see uh I see Giovanna go purpose purpose yes like a new a new purpose um yeah, purpose and he, yeah and and the discouragement that can come from having failed for many many years you know so they're they're still discouraged so anything we can do it just it reminds me of a student that for four months wouldn't talk to me and every day how are you doing can I help you I'd love to teach you this nope like the whole blockage of you're not talking to me and after four months discovered that to go in the army you needed your diploma ask me for tutoring <laughs> so, <laughs> so it could be it could be part like that could be part of the problem I know like Michelin had like an event of different things that could happen but that to me also in my in my little bubble has been a big a game changer when the students actually have a goal in mind just to i don't, don't want to like take too long on this but like what you were saying julie was very very important okay like 
I'm a divergent thinker. And I was like one of those, like, I hate school. I hate teachers. I hate everything associated. I like, that was, that was me. Right. And look where you are now. <laughs> and, and even when it kept coming, cause this kept coming back. Why don't you go into education? And I'm like, I hate school. I hate teachers. I hate that for me was like, there was a block. I'm, I'm not book smart. I'm street smart. That was like, I knew I was smart, but I, I didn't have like a logical, my, my brain does not work like everyone else. Right. So I had a, like a, a, and my mother is a teacher, by the way. So I had a, 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 a negative connotation and association with the, let's say what you need to succeed. And then when I, you know, turned the table to my students, it was like, you're not good in school because you don't practice. You want to be good in school practice. So you, when you don't succeed, you give up because it's hard at the beginning. Want to be good at soccer practice. You want to be good at piano practice. You want to be good at school practice. <laughs> so whatever subject it is goes back to what Michelin was saying with the road, with the prep. It's because they've had so many negative experiences that the, the connotation is I suck. I don't want it until they see a purpose, until they see a need and they'll see a need if it's like, yeah, you you're not succeeding because you haven't practiced. You haven't given yourself a chance to succeed. Yeah. So see, uh, I understand like you until you yeah. break that thing that might it's a goes to mindset it goes back to what I was saying before it's flip the association with not the subject not the thing but what's stopping you from going and access that thing just a last last comment just to to help you out and we have to continue because we're going to be behind too uh I used to I had a bunch of boys one year and they did like ADHD galore trust me when I say they were sitting on the tables not on the chairs and what I used to do in between let's say 10 minutes teaching session I used to get them to do all like push-ups a minute of push-ups let's go all everybody on the floor push I wasn't doing it of course they they wanted me to do it did not work but they were like competing and I would put like that one minute thing and let's go count how many people how many push-ups can you do and it's just for them to get knowingly that that there is something more than that could be fun and to them and Michelin goes how many push-ups can Mark do if he did three push-ups in twenty? <laughs> and you got it Julie <laughs> and we made joke of it but then we brought it brought them back it gave them that little incentive now I have to pay attention for because I'm gonna have that moment where I'm gonna do something else and it's just it's it's funny listen I taught Matt on a baseball field I taught Matt in the weirdest places just to get them to kind of disconnect from what we call traditional teaching because they walk into a classroom, there's desks, there's chairs, and it's automatically triggers in their brain. Oh my God, I'm gonna fail. But taking them outside and say, go measure, go do, go flip, go jump. I don't know. It just throws them off, throws them off. And that's what I wanted to do. In comfortable position, always like moving it around. I know it's exhausting for a teacher to be cre creative after a while because they still have to sit down and do things but you needed that. They needed that element. I had to read my crowd and this is what they needed. So I had to kind of give it to them. You have to give to take. <laughs> you can't just ask them to give you one way. But yeah, Julie, sorry. I know we went on a tangent, but it's really motivating. <laughs> well, it's important, I think. And and sometimes you forget how cool we are. Oh, we are. <laughs> like, well, cool. we've come, you know, we, no, but we come to a point where we're doing like the regular stuff. And all of a sudden I'm like, I remember doing that project when that was cool. I used to be cool. <laughs> I used to be cool. I should I should be cool today. And then I tell the students, put your stuff away. <laughs> and then I decide, let's do this. Like it has nothing to do with your class. Why you, I'm cool. I know I'm cool. <laughs> then sometimes we forget how creative and imaginative and, and fun we can be because we're kind of like the students, we're like weighed down with all the expectations. So yeah. Yeah. We have to go back there, Julie. Like yeah. you said, it's like we have to have fun in yeah. class and that's what we're missing. And it's going to be more motivating for the student and for us too, you know? Yeah. Well, Laura, you're cool. That I know. So, But that puts <laughs> the table on the next part of the, the presentation. So it's good that we had the, this uh, conversation. Absolutely. So here we go. So again, here, if we take a look in the context of adult general education in the age context, how to make sense of mathematics. So 
again, when we're talking about conceptual understanding, based on all the experience that we just did. And by the way, everything we've done, you've done in on this document will be shared. And hopefully it could be a shared document that even later on, you want to continue working on this will be really great. So um, this will be shared with everybody. Uh, well, you know, everybody would like to contribute. And um, again, to go back into the three basic components, when we're talking about conceptual understanding, we're talking about activating prior knowledge or build, like bringing in the component of prior knowledge. The learners target, uh, targeted for the level on the, on the concept. Uh, students' difficulty, making mistakes, again, like uh, Rita and Julie said it, uh, and celebrating mistake, making, uh, uh, making it exciting to make mistakes because mistakes give you opportunities to learn. Um, plan activities that triggers mistake, like uh, the tricky Rita, you know, and problem co contextualize the concept. Sometimes it's like, sometimes the concept is not the problem, sometimes it's the situation you put it in that is the problem. And that is something I discovered in science when we're talking about tanks, uh, what is it, um, septic tanks, not everybody <laughs> know what septic tanks, but they understand the concept. But when we got stuck on that and we couldn't move forward, right? So just to let you know, sometimes the con context is as important than the concept. Um, in terms of flexibility, we're talking moment of exchange of solution to the problem. So maybe do it individually, do it in pair, then share among the classroom. Again, it's, uh, it's just to be aware there's many ways of doing something. The choice of problems, like give them choices and let them see if they're able to transfer stuff. Uh, room to exploring solution, open-ended versus closed-ended solution. There's a time and place for both. One, if you want to, like, again, mechanically check if somebody knows how to do something versus an application of a skill. Um, the frequency of policy exchange, again, in this, uh, uh, in this case is, is, again, how flexible is your classroom or you're willing to allow your classroom to be and placing in teamwork. Teamwork, again, is very important. There's time to work alone and there's time to work in teams. Now, when we get to fluidity, it helps retention, in this case, memorization and all, you know, recall uh, of, of concept. Importance of importance of fait numérique. Like, I'm sorry. sorry. I, <laughs> I skipped That's, this one. <laughs> somehow it showed up <laughs> today. <laughs> okay. So again, this one, um, this one, again, using uh, technologies and, and uh, you know, to, to, to help you recall. A room for exploring solution. Again, what you know before, exactly like the problems we gave you with the solution. It's exploring what they know and what they remember. The process of automation. Sometimes it's also, I find it interesting that you expose the students on how their brain learn. Because sometimes they, they don't understand themselves how they, they, they think and how they, they understand. So sometimes explaining the process of learning and how we retain things might give them an incentive on saying, oh, okay, today I did not work my right side of the brain or left side of the brain, whatever. But to include them in, in the process like you're learning and it's a complex process and it's hard for everybody and just to go outside to explain to them that. Um, and also the frequency of strategy exchanges. So in class, like say, oh, you did it this way, show me. Okay, oh, you did it this way, show me. Oh, you thought about it this way, show me. Regulating our expectation uh, for the time we allow the students for execution. Uh, always just identify the time that it takes us to solve something is not the same necessarily of the students and to allow time to think because we don't mechanically. So Julie? When you were talking about how we think, uh, I every year I do a session on how your brain brain works. So every week I'll do like an hour lesson on on how do we memorize how, how like how do you biologically how does your brain work? And having the students that thought they're bad at something realize that their brain just has not had the time and the practice necessary to make those links solid and like explain it biologically and that your brain can change. Uh, and, and if there's a, a, a learning difficulty where it happens in your brain and how you can bypass it, it, it has helped the students be encouraged. And I had some students go from, I hate math, I can't do it to in level four. Well, maybe I'll take the high four. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so, so much for saying. I used to do that too. Yeah, Michelle. 
Um, I just want to say, yeah, for sure. I 100% agree. And I love that. And I wanted to work with Julie. I think, well, I will work with Julie Robitaille for the uh, uh, concept, intellectual concepts for a path to learning course. And um, I love the idea that you're doing that with the students too, Julie, because that's super cool. Because I know for me, when I've done it with my students, all of a sudden there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And listening to Gio Giovanna talk too, it's like all of a sudden it's like, okay, I, I can do this because now there's an explanation. Like even if they've had an IEP, which we don't get very often here, we don't get to see the results of those often. Um, and they they kind of are able to manage then to say, okay, they're, I'm not dumb. I I can do this. I just have to figure out how my brain works. And then that's, that's, a, that's an exciting, cool thing for them. Um, and just really quickly, I want to sneak in a comment to, for um, Laura about the motivation of students there. Um, right now, this year, I've never seen it as bad as uh, lack of participation, attendance issues, um, you know, getting them in the classroom. Yeah, too, we can do these things, but it's like, I don't know what's going on out there. So that's my little two cents on that one, too. Thank you. Well, you make me feel better that I'm not alone. <laughs> You're not. You're very far from being alone, Laura. And and like I said, men, like right now, it's it's mental mental health is really important. They need you know. Um, so so let's go back and uh, let uh, our friend Rita start the deuxième fondement, like the second principle, which is the three intentions of problem solving. We're gonna start off with a little video. Everybody knows Dan Mayers. If you don't, I will introduce you to him and he's amazing. So just to give you a little bit of uh, the, the, the background of Dan Mayer, Dan Mayer is, uh, is a teacher in high school uh, that is, 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 uh, is very revolutionary in the way he's thinking, but he's a math teacher that kind of studied why, like what can I do, you know? Uh I'm gonna start it. It's a very motivating uh, video. I like to watch it. It's been for a couple of years now that the video uh, exists. I teach high school math. Um, I, I sell a product to a market that doesn't want it, but is forced by law to buy it. I mean, that's kind of, it's just a losing proposition. So there's, there's a useful stereotype about students that I see. So now uh, we're gonna go to six minutes and uh, 40 seconds, huh, Micheline? Yes. Student. We don't involve them in the, in the formulation of the problem. Oops. Sorry, 35. You talked about the formulation of a problem being so incredibly important. Sorry, here. Um, and I'll yield the floor here for a second to Einstein, who I believe has paid his dues. He talked about the formulation of a problem being so incredibly important. And yet, in my practice, in the U.S. here, we just give problems to students. We don't involve them in the, in the formulation of the problem. So 90% of what I do uh, with my five hours of prep time per week is to take fairly compelling elements of problems like this from my textbook and rebuild them in a way that supports math reasoning and patient problem solving. And here's how it works. I like this question. It's about a water tank. The question is how long will it take you to fill it up, okay? First things first, we eliminate all the sub steps. Students have to develop those. They have to formulate those. And then notice that all the information written on there is stuff you'll need. None of it's a distractor, so we lose that. Students need to decide, all right, well, does the height matter? Does the side length matter? Does the color of the valve matter? What matters here? It's such an underrepresented question in math curriculum. So now we have a water tank. How long will it take you to fill it up? And that's it. And because this is the 21st century, and we would love to talk about the real world on its own terms, not in terms of line art or clip art that you so often see um, in textbooks, we go out and we take a picture of it. So now we have the real deal. How long will it take it to fill it up? And then even better is we take a video, a video of someone filling it up. And it's filling up slowly, agonizingly slowly. It's tedious. Students are looking at their watches, rolling their eyes, and they're all wondering at some point or another, man, how long is it going to take to fill up? <laughs> That's how you know you baited the hook, right? <laughs> and, and that question off this right here is really fun for me, because like, like the intro, I teach I teach kids, uh, because of my inexperience, I teach the kids that are the most remedial, all right? And I got kids who will not join a conversation about math because there's, like, someone else has the formula. Someone else knows how to work the formula better than me, so I won't, I won't talk about it. But here, every student is on the level playing field of intuition. Like, everyone's filled something up with water before. So I get kids answering the question, how long will it take? 
I got kids who are, who are mathematically and conversationally intimidated joining the conversation. We put, we put names on the board, attach them to guesses, um, and kids have bought in here. And then we, we follow the process I've described. And the best part here, or one of the better parts, is that we don't get our answer from the answer key in the back of the teacher's edition. We instead just watch the end of the movie. <laughs> and that's terrifying, all right? Because the theoretical models that always work out in the answer key, the back of the teacher's edition, like, like that's great, but it's scary to talk about sources of error when the theoretical does not match up with the practical. But those conversations have been so valuable, among the most valuable. So I'm here to report some really fun games with students who come pre-installed with these viruses day one of the class, okay? These are kids who, who now, one semester in, I can put something on the board totally new, totally foreign, and they'll have a conversation about it for three or four minutes more than they would have at the start of the year, which is, which is just so fun. <coughs> we're, we're no longer averse to word problems because we've redefined what a word problem is. We're no longer intimidated by math because we're slowly redefining what math is. Um, this has been a lot of fun. I encourage math teachers I talk to to use multimedia because it brings the real world into your classroom in high resolution and full color. To encourage student intuition for that level playing field. To ask the shortest question you possibly can and let those more specific questions come out in conversation. To let students build the problem because Einstein said so. And to finally, in total, just be less helpful. Because uh, the textbook is helping you in all the wrong ways. It's, helping you, uh, it's buying you out of your obligation for patient problem solving and math reasoning to be less helpful. And why this is an amazing time to be a math teacher right now is because we have the tools to create this high quality curriculum in our front pocket. It's ubiquitous and fairly cheap. And the tools to distribute it freely under open licenses has also never been cheaper or more ubiquitous. I put a video series on my blog not so long ago and it got um, 6,000 views in, uh, in two weeks. I get emails still from, from teachers and yeah. <laughs> It's nice. I just love this video. It's so motivating. Yeah, but you see, this is a teacher that actually, he has a lot of resources, right? Um, uh, just before you start, uh, Micheline, I want to, to hear to talk about the essential condition of, uh, of, of a classroom, and it's the, the proper uh, climate, the proper uh, atmosphere. Uh, can we say that? So, <laughs> so here, it, the idea is, you know, he's, he's making it fun so the student will participate. So it's going to be motivating. He's not going to do this all the time, probably. But he's going to take time to discuss math with the student. And that what makes it different for the class, you know, to, to start uh, working. Yeah. Yeah, but he's also, he, you know, those videos that he was talking about, there's a whole website that he actually, yeah, and uh, Rishad had put it in the conversation. He has a whole, uh, he has a whole uh, library of these mathematical videos that people use in the, his classroom that he, it's like, you just ask a question and you see a little video and you let the students work it, work out all this, the, the, the steps, like you said, the, the sub steps in a problem that you, a written problem. And then he'll show them the answer at the end by just showing them the rest of the video and they get them have these conversation, which is a lot more stimulating in learning math. Of course, this is not the way you, you could teach every day, but this is something you could maybe combine to what you're, you're teaching. So this could be a, a, a very interesting resource if you're interested. Um, and this brings us to the, our second principle, which is again, um, second principle, which is resort to problem solving according to different intention. And this is when we're talking about how we're using resolution of problems. So learning mathematics through problem solving, Learning, math, uh, learning mathematics for problem solving and problem solving to learn how to solve problems. So there's, there's a nuance between these three that we're gonna kind of develop in a minute. So notice over here, if I'm not mistaken, and Rita, please correct me. The next three slides are actually, uh, again, we had translated these, uh, their, um, we had translated the next three slides. So this is the second one when we're talking about learn for problem solving. So I'll let you read it. And this is the third one, problem solving to learn how to solve problems. There's two definitions that we found in the framework in the reference. 
I feel like I'm back in university reading ped stuff. <laughs> well, apologies. <laughs> because I can read it's it. okay. Yeah. Well, actually, we, 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 uh, we took it like uh, we had the video, but it was in French, so <laughs> we didn't have it in English. But uh, the second activity is going to like uh, we're going to talk about the three uh, intentions of uh, solving pro problem solving, which I think like we all know, you know, it's uh, it's not something that is very new to us, but uh, it's uh, it's we're going to have a talk about it. So we did an activity. Um, about this mm -hmm. that uh, we're, we're gonna discuss i don't know Michelle, if you want to do it all together or we do it like uh in two rooms what do you prefer i i think you know due uh to the small group we are we could probably have it as a, as a whole discussion let's do that as a whole discussion if you would like okay. i think so it's good yes so i'll i'll open up the uh the activity and uh i'll share the screen and then so I see people are starting to to come inside the the document. So it's uh, so you can write uh, your ideas. Okay. So here. So here again, learn math through problem solving. What does it mean to learn math through problem solving? What uh, in what context in age we can see this, and what are the advantages of this approach? So just to give you a bit of a time, a moment, just to think through these three, three boxes, and we can discuss each one of them. So please uh, access the document. Take five minutes, like just uh, take a few minutes by yourself if you want to fill in any of these boxes, and we will have a conversation uh, in, a, in a moment. We're good. So let's open the floor. Okay. Okay, like we said, time's up pencil down right uh okay so let's take a look over here this is some of the uh the answers that we well the answers conversation starters let's do that so when we say learn math through problem solving okay so um what does this mean in your opinion i think it was uh, julie you wrote this so are you asking me to read it or well, uh, in your own words, doesn't necessarily read or not read. In your opinion, what does it? Uh -huh. Well, I guess, well, that's what the reform was all about. That's, mm -hmm. that's what came from uh, just doing objectives to having competencies, to having tasks in our big math exams instead of just what we call the word problem. It's been developing for quite some time and finding the balance between, like you were saying before, rote questions and drills and, and things, and then and having uh, problem solving, but you can put them all together. So mm -hmm. if you if you if you find the right problem, you can incorporate the rest of your learning inside it. So if you say, well, the the tank guy, okay, earlier, so he came up with that tank. He's like, let's look at the video. Let's see how long it takes to fill. Well. It's kind of empty in, in, in learning if you're just watching the end of the video. Mm -hmm. But if you take that opportunity and you say, well, could we theoretically calculate how long it would take? And then can we compare what we found to the, like the end of the video later uh, to see how long it would take? And then and that's where the learning comes in because I like, well, how long will it take? Well, OK, well, do we know how to figure out how long it will take? What do we need to know? And that's when you you come into the, the whole learning process. So it gives it, that's why I said, what, like, what does it, uh, what's the advantage of it is that it gives you purpose. So you lead, your learning has a meaning, you know why you wanna learn something and you're manipulating concepts in a different way or situation when you're using a problem. So uh, we know that, uh, especially for language to be able to un understand a concept, you need to at least manipulate it 10 times differently uh, to be able to have a, a good grasp on that concept. So it allows us to, take different contexts and then and, and manipulate that uh, that idea and you stimulate your memory because how many of us remember that one teacher who did that one crazy thing like <laughs> well we're gonna remember that yeah. uh, and I don't know if I understood the question the same way as the others for the second one because I was like you can put anywhere uh, I do it in science all the time that's actually part of the evaluation you, they need to solve a problem uh, in in their task but uh, but yeah, that's how I took that question, I guess. 
Well, absolutely. Then they're all components, right? They're all components. And uh, I don't know if anybody would like to add the, for the first one or the second one. You have Michelle. Okay, go Michelle. I, don't, I can't okay. see. So okay, yeah. I kind of I kind of saw it differently. So that's where my math brain is definitely not at work here. But uh, I, I just see it as more of everything. So what does it mean? It's more of everything and it's not a direct route and it's showing us there's, there's many ways to solve problems and uh, I guess it, it is follow up to the where the reform is going so that's how I saw the first one yeah. cool. yeah. we're like constructing our knowledge mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. and and how about the second one does anybody see it as like just the old ways of doing things maybe bringing the old ways of just learning math to problem solve like there's a purpose I need to find a solution, right? The right answer. Which well, I know teaching the old program, like I, now it was very structured and very, this is it, this is how you do it, that's it, that's all, uh, you know. Um, so I think now there's no such thing as the one way to do something because you can use the different contexts, the different situations, um, the different uh, ways to tackle a problem, maybe. Yeah, but the books are made like that, huh? Mm -hmm. very much you know you have a concept and then you have like like you said like five exercises that you have to do and uh what but sometimes it's good you know for the the, the student to mm -hmm. like to to like have a you can take the time to understand the concept not knowing necessarily in which situation you're going to use it but you understand the concept yeah and I, I personally like to talk about the third one, solving problems to learn how to solve problems. And this was actually very, very interesting when I realized, like I was teaching, I think it was a secondary two, um, the, uh, the financial book was the secondary one, sorry for the math. And you realize like students don't know how to calculate taxes and this is an everyday skill. So what we did in class, they were not even been able to transfer it anywhere else, but this is their life. And some of them, like, I don't know how many of you have been to Provigo Metro or Super C, whatever, and you you change, you just give them a different change and suddenly they're all lost. So yeah, to bring back that in class to say solving problems, to learn how to solve problems for like solving problems to really solve real problem, which is the hands-on approach in the real world, like bringing the real world closer that, because I don't know before teaching math has to be just with math in class whatever it has nothing to do with the world but you don't realize how much math the, everyone uses on a daily basis and to make this connection I think maybe we could be able to break down a bit of the um, of the barrier of seeing okay classrooms is not just to the class walls but it's actually to to my household to my uh, my job my my real life and, and I think this is an interesting for me like I forgot sometimes you forget that you need to do those 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 mechanically bridges to to realize to tell the students those like no you do it on a really basis when you're programming a computer you're doing math you're when you're paying your taxes you're paying your when you're buying your Big Mac at McDonald's you're you're making you're doing math you know it's managing your bank account is doing math you know uh, taking medication, you're <laughs> doing math, but to them, it's like very silo in their head. It's very com 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 um, it, it's just linked to school. It has nothing to do with my own life, right? But making that, I, I think this is the third one. Uh, Julie, yeah, I, I, you're reminding me real life situations. I like telling the students that I'm a math teacher, so I should know by now after all the years I've been teaching how to calculate how much paint I need for my apartment. But then I didn't do that and I bought so much. I painted my next house with the paint I bought for the apartment. <laughs> uh, so, and then, and, and then I, I thought, sometimes I tell myself I should use my math skills. Uh, knowing what bed would fit in my boys' room because I have two boys and they're in the same bedroom. So I actually made a scale drawing from 2102. I made a scale drawing. I cut out the beds and I looked at if they would fit and how they would fit with the wardrobe. And I actually brought my plan to the store and I was like, what do you offer as but bed sizes? <laughs> Are they going to fit? And, um, and the lady at the store was like looking at me funny. And then I said, you know what? But I can measure what the distance between the heater and the bed right now so I know it won't burn. She's like, that's kind of nice. <laughs> and I like to share that with the students where, you know, sometimes I, I 
I look at my everyday life to solve my problem like my math problems but sometimes my math actually solved my everyday life yes <laughs> so, yeah, it can go both ways yeah we have to bring that uh, in in class uh, like between the three intentions which, which one uh, do we do you use more like i don't know like for me i feel like uh, uh, oh go ahead julie you raised your hand i'm sorry but i keep raising my hand because there's not very many of us so if you want <laughs> go ahead. no no it's okay go ahead i'll go uh, after you i i would love to use the first one more often but my students don't like it like it for example in science there's here's this let's explore this thing and they're like I don't know the answer I'm like yeah, I know it's an exploration but they don't like that they don't they don't like being put in an uncomfortable situation where they know nothing even though that's the point like you want to have them in that uncomfortable situation but they they often they they resent the idea unless like because I'm teaching individualized so by themselves they, they resent the idea but if I do a class and I bring everybody with yeah. me and we do something then it's, it's different. Uh, I do a lot of the second one for sure, learn math for problem solving. Uh, but the third one is probably my favorite one. Like that, that's that's my favorite because um, the more, like you said earlier, practice, but the more you solve problems to be able to solve problems, it's it's that reasoning that you're practicing and that, and that I, I, that's my favorite one. I don't use it very often with students because individ in individualized it's hard to do it by yourself so if i'm lucky enough to get a couple <laughs> students uh in the same course or level just level uh then then i try to do my best to teach uh like stand-up classes and make activities uh, with that one yeah i feel uh, the same uh, as you uh julie when i used to teach uh i used to be more in the the two last one and the first one like is more uh, it's not it's not always easy to find something that you can do with the entire group so sometimes it's more complex to to approach uh mathematic uh, with this intention in individualized uh, teaching mm -hmm. but uh yeah me too i like i i think we do a, a lot of the the two last one well the book actually the all the most of the material they go with the the second intention which they are like they learn math and then they they, they do problem solving yeah. so far that's the first one so far that's the first one and scares students i'm sorry yeah, it scares yeah. everybody skip it <laughs> not I, everybody but uh, i mean like the student they don't like it so they like it or they come to see you they're like oh i don't know how to do it alone and we're like oh okay. well i I think SOFAT doesn't do a very good job on the first one. I, and I also think that like they, these three things kind of mix together. You can't just say, I'm going to do everything through the first part. You yeah. can. I'm going to do everything through the second part. I think ideally, ideally, but not quite the way SOFAT does it, is yeah, you kind of present a situation where where you're like okay this is the problem what do we need to solve it and mm -hmm. then you learn all all the different math that goes with it which you're learning math for solving yes. problems it gives a yeah. purpose but it yeah to give a purpose yes. so the first part is good to give a purpose but you can't learn everything that way yes but yeah. i love uh, what you said uh, laura like you said you have to have a balance you know of yeah. you cannot do everything and that's what mm -hmm. the framework tells us it tells us that we should, you know, work with the three intentions, but at different levels and with the appropriate timing, you know, and yeah. that, 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 that is like a different way of like seeing it instead of like just doing like one intention or two intentions. Uh, Michelle? Yes. Okay. So I had an aha moment because uh, it goes back to when I first moved to Quebec and I had to learn or I wanted to learn French and the teacher kept saying, let's say La Fanite. And I'm like, okay, I have not, what is that? Like, you know, there's no picture, there's no pointing. There's just like, you, un you should understand it. So like, I'm like, 
okay, I'm trying to problem solve and it's not working. So when I got the SOFED books with the new math and then it was like the big problem solving and it's like, I'm thinking, oh my gosh. So it was like a traumatic moment for my, for trying to learn French to now saying, hey, like how are we gonna do problem solving when there's no prior learning, there's no information, there's no nothing to share to there's. So I, I, I appreciate this workshop, I guess, just in that experience, because now that, that, that way that I learned or you know, the French that I learned that was not the way to learn French for me, um, like I have to remember that, okay, maybe this does have a place in learning, but uh, I can see where it's a weakness for me because of just my prior experiences as, as a learner in itself. So uh, yeah, so that's really interesting. So thanks for, for doing this because yeah, that's insightful for me. Yeah. Thank you. Well, so you know, Julie, just to, just to add something, you know, Julie, what you're saying about your kid's room, by the way, I actually did something similar I actually went to Ikea and I stole all their catalogs once upon a time. And the manager saw me leave with like 20 catalog and he came after me and was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm a math teacher and I would like to get my students to create rooms, their math, like their room and create budget and stuff. And he was, oh, that's such a great idea. And you know what? He, go, he goes to me, why don't you get me the top three and maybe we could display them? And I thought that was brilliant. Okay, it was a mistake, like kind of, it was like a bad thing that turned good. So I went to my class and I, and I gave my students, I say, okay, everybody gets a catalog. You have this dimension of a room. Use whatever fits in that room, but you have to have this, this, this. So I give them restrictions and I say, go ahead and design your room, but I would like to have a scale, right? So scale, so it has to be based on a real dimension. So they have to learn proportions and scale through making a diorama. And I can tell you, it was magical to see how, and it says a lot about the people that are doing it. Some they just use like, you know, like you say, cut up of a bed. Some they did actually, they got Barbie beds. And I said, if I take the scale here and I measure it in your room, it'll be the same, I'll be able to, and it was amazing that they were able to do that. And I, I didn't go back to IKEA for it with it, but it was something that these students, like you should see, they were working on this project more than anything else because they thought at, at the beginning, they thought it was silly, but they didn't understand the concept of proportions and scale, but the fact that they had to recreate it. So if you're in an individualized setting, all you have to do is, I'm not going, I'm not saying go get an IKEA <laughs> catalog, but maybe this could be something that the student could learn. If this like scales and proportions something, and I know this is a basic concept that everybody struggles with, Maybe it's a side project they could do in math that could be fun and could be displayed. And I did make a display of their bed, like the bedroom or a living room. I gave them a choice, an area in the room of the house in an apartment and they had budgets. And so I had to combine, I cross combined stuff. It was super interesting. They had such a fun time and people who did not know what they went to ask their peers and stuff. It was really stimulating, but it could be done. It's just, again, the time, the prior knowledge, the interest of the students, you know, but it's, it's still about, I used to use them a lot like a pilot project. But that being said, now to link, to, to segue to the students' roles and the teachers' roles, now it changed, it changed and shifted, right? So having these three intentions in mind, the, 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 the responsibility of the learning kind of shuffled kind of shifted but yet it's still in balance which is an interesting one laura you have uh, something to yeah just a question for michelin that yeah. this little project you were talking about what grade did you do that with Sec three. what level <laughs> Sec three. no no no, because it sounds really interesting so i want to pass it on so it fits oh, in I nice I can actually, I, I've done a few other ones. I could give you the whole documentation and everything. And I could, I did one for a garden. They made garden beds and one was the bedroom design. So I had two, three projects that I actually got them. I could send them to you. You could, guys could try them if you're interested. Yeah, no, sure. I'd love to. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. For me sure. too, me too. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> I'll send it. I'll send you all. Because I, I, I did it for the hands-on, like I, I've done a workshop before, which is a hands-on uh, approach on learning how to do math. And these came up and actually what we did is we did it like my class would do like a, a garden bed for the Endeavor students and the Endeavor students will like keep it up with like planting, uh, like, you know, the, 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 the student, like the school's garden, right? So everybody had to sign their name, whatever. It was really cool, it became like, 
a math project that with a purpose, you know, and a community spirit. So I was always working with the with the intention of creating like you're bigger than just a math book or a math problem. But this is cool stuff. I will I'll share with all everyone. So just to, to get back here. So hopefully here you'll notice this is what you're hoping. Uh, oops, there's a title missing. Sorry. So this is what you should be hearing in class when you're having the right, um, how can I say, the correct climate, everything's going well. There are all students. Of course, this is an ideal dream. Uh, all students are committed. Students are teacher using technology. Teacher addresses group in different places, not always in front of the class. Teacher asks more questions to the student than the answer. Uh, objects, manipulative, are there subgroups of collaboration, mathematic discussion? A student asks questions. The class is sometimes noisy but active. You know, um, student communicates their idea and strategy. Maybe a wall of strategy could be put together. Teachers circulate and observe their students, where they're like taking mental notes on how they support them. Uh, teacher and students have fun together. Fun, fun, fun. It's really important just to change that stigma around math, and not fun at detrimental of learning either. So just the right balance. And students make mistakes and readjust. And of course, like Judy said it best, we are cool. Definitely we're cool. Math teachers are cool. So here are some rec recommendations, but uh, actually it's it make the classroom a community of learning learners. So make the student talk to each other, interact, uh, speak mathematics in class. Uh, so this is essential uh, in the learning of math uh, and the construction of knowledge. Uh, Ideas are important, uh, regardless of their origin. So we listen to the student, we let them like construct the idea. And sometimes they will understand that, okay, this is, this makes them understand something. Um, and the climate of trust in which the error is considered necessary for learning, it must be established because this is one of the, the biggest obstacle we get uh, uh, not the biggest, but this is one of the obstacles that we have uh, in with our students. They don't have a good relationship with math, and they associate that a mistake is it means that they're not good, they're not smart enough, they're not so. So we have to reconstruct that. Okay, so uh, just to just to go back over here, the recommendation, of course, this is this is recommendation. Everybody has his environment, and please be flexible and fluid, and use your conceptual understanding of today's. Uh, principles uh, to adapt to your environment. Hopefully we were able to, well, uh, question and clarify the activities with intentions that you may give to your student, understand how to better intervene according to the intervention framework. And hopefully we gave you something to reflect on your teaching practices. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, I don't know if um, if you have a, if you have any questions, I just want to just add one more thing. All the uh, all the presentation today we will be putting it for you as a PDF. You'll be able to to live with it. I'll be sending everybody the other documents that for those hands-on approach. But I want to give you a sneak peek about something that we might consider. Um, later on in one of the Formation Nationale Mathematique, which is uh, um, math discussions, talk math. Uh, the next one is not gonna be about uh, math discussion. The next one, just to give you a heads up, is going to be about hands-on approach in teaching mathematics. So it's gonna be the, 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 the it's going to be in February, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, this is what's coming up. But please, if you have any topic that you would like us to kind of go further and do the research to bring you all the interesting um, interesting teacher, uh, teaching or what's happening elsewhere, let us know. Because I feed my topic out of suggestions, of the, the sector suggestions. So this is something that came about that I thought was super interesting. A lot of people wanted to do hands-on approach in math. So this will be something that we'll take in consideration. I know in the past also they saw the, the, the literacy, which we've done also in the past. But if there's a topic that is close to your heart that you would like more, more, more information about, let us know. I would rather answer a request that you have. We just have a bit more time to do the research than you. That's all. 
I know you're in class, you're busy. So if we could do that, put it together for you to, to fill, up, fill in your toolbox, we're here for that. And uh, also to say a big, huge thanks to all of you for coming. That's to start off with one. I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful for Rita for uh, accepting to co-host with me. She is the better half. <laughs> and Richard always being there uh, as, as our skeleton to keep us going. So, and thank you, everybody. That's it. So thank you, you everybody. It was very nice. The, I love the discussions.